All right, he's there, ladies and gentlemen. Chat, hello. The person that you asked me is there, right there. Look at this. Andrew, welcome to the stream. Oh, such a pleasure to be here, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so stoked for this. I'm really excited. You know, you're not the only one. They've been super hyped to have you. And they were like, we want the Tish. So apparently they call you the Tish. Is that a thing? <laughs> like they were like, we want the, uh, the yeah. Tish. It, uh, it, <laughs> it started as a joke and the joke just kind of grew and went from there. And I, I think I have uh, <laughs> Rosemary and Co to thank for this because we were coming up with a name for a brush that we were designing together. And like, what do you want to call it? And I was thinking about like something. I, I was thinking of all these different names, like the Texan Tickler or the the Edge Master. I, and then I was like, oh, we're going to call it the Tish, because uh, I just thought it was so ridiculous. And then it then it stuck. And but I, you know, if there's a line with a joke, I'll take that flying leap over it. And I even put it on a hat. I've got a hat now. Some of my poor academy students are wearing this silly hat. And me sometimes it says do you even tish bro so I, I think it's important you know we don't take ourselves too seriously but it, it's fun it's fun yes yeah, so people call me the tish but my, my name's andrew andrew tischler nice to meet you if you haven't heard or seen me before it's no, so, no so I, awesome to first of here. all like if you haven't heard of andrew like first of all who are you i don't know you anymore <laughs> chat get out of here uh but well no like for like like Imagine there's one person on YouTube who doesn't know about you. Like, who are you really? What do you What do you do in your life, and where Where do you live? Where do you come from? Uh, I mean, that's very kind, but I I do get comments still uh, quite often from people saying, "Oh, I just discovered you," and and yeah. that's so awesome. So this turnover on still... YouTube, like, not a lot of people is yeah. trying to learn painting at the same time. Like, you have some new mm. new like person coming up all the time like some people come yeah. picking up paint for the first time and they just discover us so that's pretty cool that's right it, and you know it's very niche you know when you think about it um pushing around some colored mud on a cloth with a, a stick with a bunch of hair <laughs> stuck to the end of it it's very niche what we do <laughs> super niche and, yeah. um and, and and so it is great when people especially figurative discovery. like figurative painting because yeah. you have a yeah. lot of painting like general but like the kind of figurative art, like it's more for people are, who are really into making this type of stuff because it takes a bit of training, lots of like lots of training yeah. actually, uh, yeah, effort, absolutely. dedication. So it's it's even more yeah. niche than just painting. See? Yeah. Well, see, you're you're more the figurative type artist. I mean, I love your art, man, and um, been following you for years and years. And I, what you do just kind of blows my mind, dude. Um, so I, I need to get more into the figurative stuff. I, I love portraiture, but in terms of full figures, I mean, some of the some of the kind of the dreamscapes and this imaginative realism mm -hmm. that you incorporate in your paintings, it's really cool. Well, thanks. And so that must take a lot of development to get those ideas across. And so I, I would love yeah. to do more of that kind of stuff one day. But uh, I, I'm, my head's in the landscapes at the moment. I'm producing a course for my well, academy. Your, your landscape, I have to say, they, they're still like breathtaking. Like I had the, this one that I really love for the thumbnail. So if people just came in, you, they saw the, <laughs> the thumbnail with like the this little like ochre, like mesa kind of. Yeah, it's know. King George Falls in the Kimberley. It's um, it's it's a really iconic scene up in the far northwest uh, of Western Australia, and it's it's this dual falls system, and it's just it's incredible. Not many people have actually seen it in real life. There's Jim Meeker. Do you even Tish, bro? Yeah, Jim Tishes. Jim definitely <laughs> Tishes. Jim's uh, Jim's the man. <laughs> but um. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a cool one. So I, I'm kind of known for the Australian type landscapes, but now I, uh, that I'm living in New Zealand, um, there's just such an abundance of subject matter. So originally you're from Australia, is that it? No, uh, I was born in Texas. Uh, so oh. my entire family's from Austin, Texas. I was born, well, actually I was born in a little, little place called Kerrville, Texas. My whole family's from Austin, so I just tell people I'm from Austin. We left when I was six years old, moved to New Zealand, I uh, kind of grew up there between the ages of, um, what was it? It was six to 10, we were in New Zealand. Then family moved, migrated over to Australia. 
And then from uh, from there, I ended up marrying a, a Kiwi girl at, that I met in Perth, Western Australia, Rachel. And then we, we moved over here to New Zealand. And uh, yeah, now we have a son and uh, it's awesome. T tell me again the, the name of your son. Hugo. Hugo, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's just turned two and uh, he's cute, but a tornado. An absolute handful. <laughs> <laughs> Two is the worst. I, I, I know you can relate. You've got, yeah, you've yeah. Got, yeah. I'm or just kids. out of this phase, like the terrible two. It's yeah. like, it's the worst. I think there's the teenage years is the next time it's going to really get tough. But like the terrible two oh, phase man. is like, it's something. I'm not looking forward to the teenage phase. <laughs> I, I know, I, was like I, I, know I can handle a teenager like much better than a two year old. Like they're wild. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> awesome. Oh, it's so cool. I, I'm in the live chat here as well. And I am, um, I, I, I recognize like most of these names, 99% of these names. That's awesome. So that's cool. We, we've got a lot of mutual followers here, which is really, really yeah. cool. I'm excited to get into whatever we're talking about today. Yeah. Well, it's just like, you know, cool hangout party with people in chat, like the amazing people in chat. And uh, it's going to be like, just a cool um, moment together. You do whatever type of art you want in the background. If you want to just put down your pencil for a moment to just interact with chat, people will not like blame you for it. I promise they'll, they'll be nice <laughs> because usually I do almost nothing in my, like, like you see the advancement of this painting. Well, it's not going to go much further. I can tell you in the end. Um, I uh, just my mods here. Uh, I don't know if ev anybody is here. Mm, mods, make sure that you switch cameras from here and out. Like you have the commands right here for everybody who doesn't know. Uh, right here, exclamation point split is to get this view. Exclamation point guest is to have Andrew's solo view like this. Uh, and then what a view. Yeah, what a view! Perfect. <laughs> you're, you're like you're you're an also awesome, um, handsome guy. So, and if, <laughs> if you, so, you can zoom don't, in don't on zoom, Andrew don't, if you don't want, do that to me. and and you can also have host view, which is me. Hello, and yeah, that's it. And just um, yeah, for the mods, make sure that you switch cam sometimes, and uh, make sure that people awesome. uh, behave in chat. So, Andrew, what are you going to do today? All right, I, I've just switched my camera to my desk view, and I just want to show people so they appreciate what what uh, what I had to go through here. Uh, bear with me. Uh, so, I, I'm going to alternate just from my end between these two cameras, just mm -hmm. over the Zoom link that we're we're hosting this on. Um, so, right now, like I, this is right here, a selfie stick with my mobile because I can't work two DSLRs at the same time because I've lost my USB hub. So I'm coming to you from my mobile, which which is kind of taped. Yes, that's masking tape, taped <laughs> to a uh, an arm here. And I got my mic down here. Hello, hello, you can hear me right now. Okay, so- Masking so tape, kinda, masking tape can do anything. Yeah, I, <laughs> exactly. What can't you do with masking tape? But I, I, um, I, I I, I find I'm doing this. I'm always working in these little crowded spaces and bumping into the cameras. So some of my academy students can can tell you about getting seasick because the camera is kind of bouncing around after my shoulder or head hits it. But anyway, this is my setup here. So what I've got here, and we go and switch to this other view. Um, oh, and it keeps inverting, which is really annoying. So I'll, I'll I'll see if we can keep it the right way up. I'm just working on my desk. So normally this is my digital setup. This is my mm -hmm. Wacom tablet and I, I work with this on my iMac. And so normally I'm doing some digital design here, but today I was going mm -hmm. to do some drawing and just cool. do a little bit of show and tell, talk to you about some of the stuff that I'm working on, but I was going to get into the sketchbook. I'm actually working on um, today and, and uh, a lot of my students would have seen some of this stuff already, but I'm actually working on this really cool Whoa, stuff. Called that's that's stone cool. Paper. So oh yeah, I've got some of these. They, they sent me oh. some of this to to try as well. I don't know what brand you, you oh, they sent this they to, sent you, it but... to you. I have to I have to buy all my stuff. What are you, what, are you hook me up? Bro? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even talk about it. Like they send me stuff, but I am not an influencer, so I don't just I say okay, just send it. And <laughs> but it, I I don't use it that much. I, I didn't have like you know so many like nice things to say about it and I didn't try to use it 
to its mm. like full extent. So I, I I'm not gonna do an, a honest review on yeah. it. I don't I just don't have time. Oh, so I, I but, hope the resolution's coming through okay. It's I mean at my end it's not super HD, but anyway, yeah, I, I'm also coming to you from rural New Zealand. The nearest town is like two and a half hours away. So we've got like the Starlink thing hooked up. But anyway, I, I'm oh, starting, starting really for, yeah it, even still like i it's not quite not all the areas are, are fully connected but that's and, crazy when you so, think about it like you're really on the other side of the world yeah, for, like yeah, it's nuts, compared to me like you really like if i dig a hole i think i i can find you directly like <laughs> like a, a <laughs> hole through the, the center hole. of the earth and it, it might fill with pacific ocean yes yeah, so just careful uh, uh, shovel yeah, I can swim. Um, I mean, I can swim. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I, I've got. Um, it looks amazing. It looks like that I'm working out. It looks like etching. Yeah, so, it looks so like prints. What I'm really, um, it's what crazy, I'm really, man. Uh, taken with is is mechanical pencils and using these. But my favorite has got to be a two B lead. So I, I've got this brass mechanical pencil. Mm -hmm. It's really heavy. I, I think the official weight of it, it's like 36 grams, this one. They do make a lighter one at 26 grams, but this is a Y Studio mechanical pencil. And they will not return my emails. I mean, speaking of sponsors and stuff. So when you do this stuff, sometimes you, you're you blessed to work with an awesome sponsor like uh, Blue Ridge or, or Rosemary Co. But these guys, I, so so if anybody wants to email and, and, and spam Y Studio and tell them Tish sent you, uh, go for it. But I love their stuff. I, I, this is my favorite pencil. And so I find that the stones- The golden really pencil. Tight. Uh, well, yeah, Brad, the golden pencil. Yeah, as soon as I saw it, I was like, "Ooh, shiny!" And I, I didn't use it for a while, and then, uh, and but now, yeah, go figure. It's it's one of the favorites. But chat type this, um, exclamation point guest zoom to zoom in on Andrew's. Like, really, it looks like an etching. I, I don't believe that it's real. So type exclamation <laughs> point guest zoom, and you'll zoom in on whatever Andrew is showing right now, just to see if it works. Yeah, so it's um. It's really interesting doing the drawing because I, I'm convinced that drawing really is the foundation of painting. If you can draw, then you can paint. And it's never too late to go back to the sketchbook and work on your techniques, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. and it's not just wielding the pencil, but this really is my thinking space to work out composition, to work out value structure, to work out lighting and really explore the subject more. And for me, it's, it's a really elaborate form of note taking. Um, now, I, I don't know, but on my screen, I just got to say on my screen, this is looking weird. So I do have some HD videos because it's, uh, yeah, I don't even know if you can actually see. It's okay. It. Yeah, it's a little bit better look there. It's a little bit pixelish, but yeah, yeah, it, it works. We might just have to bear with the technology, but uh, y you can see that there's there's quite a bit of marks in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, the, the zoom is not super HD. It's not ultra 4K, no. but it it works. It's decent enough. Oh, so so yeah, this is just hold a, on. A few whoa, whoa, ideas, hold. So. Not so fast. Not so fast. What, what's that? I, I'm not showing you that one. I don't like it. Why? <laughs> is that no, just this, mountain just, uh, texture? Uh, it looks cool. Yeah, just just a bit of mountain texture. Yeah, but and, I love um, texture. I'm just I'm obsessed with texture. So like, you can show me texture with no subject, like. Just nothing but texture, and I still I'm in love with just that. <laughs> so well, there, there's something about this. So so working on the stone paper, the really cool thing about it is it's it's a stone incorporated into some sort of resin, and so it's it, there's no tree pulp or plant fiber in there at all, which is super weird if you're used to working on paper, yeah. and it feels like mm. velvet, like almost like a like a leather type material, but it has still got a paper quality to it. The sheets are pretty thick. The only downside that I found, um, which is just a case of learning to work with it, is you know too much pressure really does tend to tear the paper. So you can pierce the paper with your pencil if you're not, you know, working, um, mm. you know, paying attention too closely. Um, so so it does. You do and, want to. And you have to pressure. you have to make sure that you don't need too much of erasing. In the process because it erases well, less well, actually, easily like well, on my I, the, the I one found, i tried um, oh okay 
I, I, mind you, I, I, I tend to draw, you know, it, it, it's not like charcoal where you can reveal those highlights so easily with a beatable erase or something like that. But I, I tend to leave these void spaces. So if I do have to reveal some highlight, if I got a bit of graphite that's smudged into that zone, mm. it does make it easier. But if I had to kind of erase something in here, I can, I might be able to achieve a bit of a mid-tone highlight mm. with something like that. So if I wanted to get a bit of yeah, a like a it's just there. I was talking about like complete erasing, like just remove yeah, everything no, and, and go back to white, uh, the, the white of the paper. Difficult. It's like it's difficult. Like you don't get perfect yeah. erasing. But if you if you can know um, if you know how to work around this. It's, it's fine. What is the paper? Absolutely I missed so. it. It's uh, Andrew. Can you say Karst again the paper? Stone paper. Karst stone paper with a K, K A R K A R S T. And I think if you go to karstpaper.com, uh, you'll see it. But just Google it, and their website will come up. It's. it's Are you partnered cool. with them? No. Okay. I, I'm gonna say uh, a different. I'm gonna say, um, hey, thanks for the screenshot. Uh, but I think it's going to take me actually. So, but whatever. I'm gonna take a, dis a, a screenshot. Sorry. Like people can take screenshots of. Like, okay. Okay. But um, cool. Uh, I'm gonna show you another brand. Like I think one, the one that I got was from Etched. Well, go on. Talk to them. I'm gonna find this uh, sketchbook because it's another brand. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so. One thing you do, you, you might see this, this is something that I try to avoid, uh, rookie mistake. So I was just working there with a bit of uh, the paper. I, you, you do want to lay down some sheets if you're going back to work down uh, on, a, on an existing drawing. So you want to lay down something here to provide some buffer so you don't destroy your artwork like I just did. Silly me. What an amateur. So sometimes a sheet of card can really help just separate out those pages, but it also gives you a bit of a pad to work on. So today, I actually, I want to, I want to also uh, give a bit of a shout out to my buddy, uh, Mr. Samuel Earp. I'm sure many are following Samuel. Um, he's a dude. He's my brother from another mother. I just love that guy. We just got back from Wellington. We we're doing a plein air trip together, painting the coast down there in, in Wellington, as well as, uh, a few of the hillsides just outside of Wellington. And um, this isn't references related to that, but uh, he gave me something. To, I, I, so I'm all over the place, forgive me. I get excited. My, my, my students that follow me in my academy can tell you that Tish gets excited. Uh, he sent me this book. Sam sent me this book as a gift because I kept threatening to steal his. And I'm just loving this. So I'm gonna work with some of these ideas today. If you really wanna take your painting further and learn some really cool techniques, I do highly recommend this book. Another guy that I recommend is Ted Kautsky, K-A-U-T-Z-K-E-Y, I think, I think. But just do a Google search, the autocorrect will find the right spelling. He died back in the 50s, uh, Ted Kautsky did. But great in terms of pencil techniques, I, a lot of my pencil technique I learned from Ted Kautsky, but compositionally, Ted Kautsky and Edgar Payne Man, these guys had it going on. So this is a book called The Composition of Outdoor Painting, specifically for plain air techniques. There's no reason you can't just flip through this and refer to it in the studio when you're trying to do some studio work. Now, the yeah. one thing I really love about Payne is the way he kind of breaks down uh, value structure in a landscape mm. and really boils down till he finds the essence of the yeah. idea. And that's, for me, landscape painting portrait painting all of it is about communication and and think about it when you're talking to somebody else and you can hear this i i tend to do this i'm, I'm like a fire hydrant or fire hose but as soon as i start talking about art it's just Bleh! but if you want to communicate something simply and elegantly the fewer things you say the better and the better you say those few things even better and yeah. this is the thing i love about edgar payne's work is that he'll make a simple statement about something and they're just they're just all inspiring but yeah, that's this, the, that's this the stuff wild. that's the stuff i struggle the most it's keeping things simple like my work oh, tends man. to be over complicated and super rational and sometimes too much and like i find that sometimes like the purity and just making sure that it's like you know nice and, and like you, you can like the eyes is is directly oriented and doesn't have to like jungle juggle with like multiple things at the same time it's sometimes it's like For better sure. but it's like it's the most difficult stuff to do like making things oh, simple is actually not simple and uh, yeah 
that's crazy yeah absolutely it, look there there is a there is a way to to this there is a, and it's there's an art to this and I, I tend to do that as well like when i'm painting a, a big landscape painting I, I it's just like i've got a salt shaker of details that are sitting to the right of the easel and i just sprinkle that stuff all over the painting and now suddenly i've got subject matter spread throughout and it does it can confuse the message but at the same time sometimes you know, and I, and I, I'll argue that this is the the case with a lot of the work that I see you do. Um, sometimes it can work from a narrative point of view because sometimes those paintings with an abundance of focal points can tell that story and keep your eye going. But I, just right now, I'm just on a bent where I'm just trying to simplify it, and so th this is something that is, is really, uh, really inspiring me. But uh, particularly his boats. I mean, look at that. There's nothing to it. It's light against dark, dark against light. Very simple shapes but just so elegant. Yeah. So I'm going to be working with this and um, shout out to Samuel Earp again. Love you, bro. Thank you for sending me this book. Mm. Um, beautiful gift. And I went to uh, to the, um, and, and maybe uh, one of the mods can zoom in on this. I, I keep a lot of my reference on my iPad. And so I've got all of these uh, files here of different landscape projects. And this one here is called Mount Talbot Vertical. I've painted Mount Talbot so many times, but it's a spot down in the South Island. Uh, wow. just before you head to Milford Sound and it's just beautiful and I I've seen this this scene so many times before but I got to stand here and paint this scene plein air and bringing this back to the studio whenever you're painting plein air it's difficult to boil it down mm -hmm. but I got the book now so I can you know explore a little bit more how to do this but when we get our reference material back to the studio I don't know about you but, I, but I've found this so much is that you get back to the studio and you're like I remember it being so much more epic than, than mm -hmm. what I'm seeing here yeah. in the photograph. So it's our job as artists to really pick that thread out, mm. find it again, and get that feeling, that awe back into the painting. And I found one way of doing it is by kind of rearranging in a way. Because think about it, when you're out in the field, like this scene is all encompassing. It surrounds you. Three yeah, you have like the stereoscopic yeah. view. So you have like Beautiful. the whole scenery, yeah. like 360 actually. Like your brain yeah. keeps all this information let's but like a, a camera can't just keep everything around like you almost need to take like a, a 360 shot of everything around to remember yeah and, and it's like it's like when you when you find that function that panoramic function on your um on, there i went and did it I, I bumped the camera yeah like that 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 panoramic function like on your phone when you're shooting a landscape and you're trying to get all of the landscape in everything is so diminutive everything's so tiny it's just it's just a little bitty on the screen yeah, so how yeah. do you translate that into mm -hmm. something so this is my process for kind of taking that idea teasing it apart but i i think this painting would really suit a vertical format there's something else going on here that i think is really interesting you'll notice that there are little blocks like it's like re arranging a room and putting furniture in the way so you can't actually walk through the room so we got like rocks to trip on here. I do like the rocks, but mm -hmm. I want to start arranging these in such a way that there's a flow from one thing to another. So it actually allows mm -hmm. you access into the landscape. So that's something else that designing this will really help. You know, so I'm seeing like four really, really heavy things. We got the mountain, tree, tree, and rock. And, and, and between those, is there a way that I can arrange that to create a flow between those elements and have that water there be the device to access that landscape. So that's something I'm going to play with today. Just do a little bit of sketching, hanging out. Yeah, sounds cool. like fun. So man, you have yeah, some man. epic, some epic videos like the helicopter one. It's crazy. These scenes, <laughs> like these places, are just yeah, man. The um, uh, if if you can, I just say if you haven't seen the uh, the helicopter video yet, uh, you'll find it up on my YouTube channel. Go and watch it. Uh, YouTube's changed, man. It's killed my views. What's going on? I I, I know we said we weren't gonna. Well, yeah, we you, gonna, you can you can make an <laughs> epic. You can YouTube. make a pretty epic <laughs> video and it will tank for it some reason because the title was not good or I don't know. Like there's yeah. they're weird like that, but who cares? I mean, I think uh, like actually I know I care. <laughs> I'm saying who cares, but like it's hard to not care about. <laughs> like reaching the people who might like to see what you're doing so exactly man exactly yeah. it, it, it hurts it hurts but you, you think you think no I, i'm not gonna be sucked into this i'm gonna just 
make that because that's what I love doing, you know. You know, it's good in the beginning when you're small and like they sort of, it, it makes you get bigger and then it makes you want to stay like lots of views, lots of, you know, reach. And in a way, if you don't get reach, like like you're just talking in the void and people don't get to see and and use whatever you you want to teach and just. Mm. It's kind of sad. Like if you're just alone talking in a room, whatever you're saying might be the best thing in the world. Like if nobody's here to hear it, I mean, what's the point? Uh, I think I think we, we that's that's the making of a saying. If an artist pontificates in the studio and no one, no one's around to hear it, did it happen? Or is there something like a tree falling in the woods mm. and no one's around? Does it make a sound? I don't know. That doesn't quite. Uh, work. You're you're getting uh, philosophical uh, uh, now. Like always. Uh, <laughs> I like this. Speaking of tanking views, just wait till I get philosophical. Every <laughs> oh no, I um, I do get philosophical on every. <laughs> so I'm on your channel right now. If you want, we can we can have a look at your. Um, oh cool. Helicopter. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Those are some old videos coming up, dude. Uh, if you just uh, go to videos. Which ones? Uh, if you click on videos on that tab, I, I do want to just make sure I don't miss this question from Sarah Churchill. G'day, Sarah. Oh, it's good to see you. I know Sarah. Uh, Sarah. Um, uh, okay. Sarah said, your values are amazing, Andrew, but I still find it hard to make a dark purple as in the mid-ground in your reference. Do you use black or something else? Yeah, really good question, Sarah. So uh, let me just uh, if i flick back to this reference i'll 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 sure. answer that but do you want to do you want to go ahead you were going to show the video thing there no whatever we were just talking um, about helicopter shots and i was like i mean the tish has to make some epic videos so we we, we might show them like just the, the the one you were referring to but we can do yeah, that yeah, later go ahead and pull it up oh okay okay just just uh, you're, you're just re right. respond first Okay, cool. Well, one thing I want to say is that we, we have to be aware, like we are blessed now to have amazing technology at our fingertips. No, not AI. Okay. Go and watch my latest video. That that got some hate, by the way, the AI video, but whatever, moving on. I haven't um, watched it, but, but we can talk but about we that. Have some, we have some really cool uh, tools at our disposal. One of them is, is photography and digital photography, but there's a danger here because what cameras do, depending on the settings of your camera, normally, like, truth be told, you know, I'm just shooting with my DSLR and I've got to just switch to full auto because I'm shooting all this different stuff. I just allow the little device to pick up my exposure, but I make sure I bracket between things that are in the highlight, like here, right? And things that are in the shadow. So I take multiple exposures and then I can work with it from there. But if you're working from like a single photograph here, I'm just going to be using this one just as the seed of the idea. We'll see what can grow from there. You'll notice that your values are actually compressed. So whilst this might register as a dark purple, almost black, if I was to put that in the mid-ground in my painting, I would absolutely kill the depth. So there are really four main things that we're focused on when we're when we're painting a, a landscape. And, and I, I talk to my students about this flow chart of sorts, you know, the considerations of art. What are the things that make a great painting? Well, for me, it's line and shape, tone or your value structure, color and edge. And if you do a good job with those four, it'll lead to a convincing sense of form, depth, light, and material. But let's let's have a look here and just think about this in terms of tone or, or value, right? Here we've got a really dark, dark. It's nearly black because the shadows in our photograph are completely drawn away. But we know one thing about what light does and what contrast does over depth or over atmospheric space is that in our shadows when they drop away to dark that dark that black should be only reserved for our immediate foreground you know when we're working from life and when i was painting this plain air that's why it's so important to work from direct observation this was actually much lighter in terms of value or tone i prefer the word tone um i don't know why just always have but i i this was a much lighter tone or or value and but here in the photograph the digital camera went yeah no lights coming out of there black so if we copy this that's why you could tell there's a lot of people who are the photo realists and paint from photographs um you'll see that they actually will incorporate those aberrations or, or those kind of errors in the way the camera picks up the landscape mm. they'll incorporate that in their painting 
But you can always tell those that work plain air or have actually studied what light does in nature because you'll see that their value structure throughout the landscape is, is on point. So darkest darks in the foreground, and then you're progressively getting lighter in the background. Again, case in point, we know here this is made up of rock, right? We can see the blackness of some of those shadows. But back here, is this not also made up of rock? And that's dropped away to violet. Now, so the camera picked up some of it, mm -hmm. but where it really lets us down is this shadow being cast inside the valley. And it's dropped away completely to black. And so we, when we know this, when we understand what light does over depth, what the landscape does over extreme atmospheric distance, then we can get those errors out. And so this is one thing that I know now from work in plain air for years and, and also just, you know, studying the landscape from life and just observing, uh, you, you start to pick these things up. So you make sure you don't incorporate those errors in your painting. So to answer Sarah's question, to go back to that, how do you achieve this dark purple? Well, first, you don't, but if you were going to achieve a dark purple of sorts, my favorite combinations of colors are actually based on the CMYK printing system. And so for this, I'd be using my cyan and my magenta. So cobalt teal as my cyan. Oh. If you want to find cobalt teal, you want to, want yeah, to look out. You're for talking yeah. about love here. Oh, dude. Oh, no. Okay. Let, let's, let's get, let's get romantic here, bro. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Just... Uh, PB28, PB28 or PG50. Uh, and different companies make them. I love, love, love Eric Silver's Cobalt Teal. Mm -hmm. In fact, all I use is Blue Ridge Oil Paint. Yeah, they're, they're not all the same and they can look very different depending they on can. how they, they process can. it. Exactly so, right. Well, exactly I'm, right. What I'm, so I'm looking for is ideal, what I call ideal cyan. And yeah. the one, the one yeah, by yeah. Sennelier, they get for me for what's easily available for me. The Sennelier one, PG50, is the like ideal cyan. It's right in there, mm. just n in between green and and blue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sennelier, they do some great paint. They're very hot paint as well. It's hit or, and, and hit it or miss. Hit or miss, really. Uh, okay, I've heard great things about him. Uh, in fact, Samuel, speaking of Samuel Earp again, um, he used to use those uh, back in the day. He now uses Blue Ridge as well. I, I converted mm -hmm. them, so I'm very proud of that. But um, uh, yeah, so, so basically, oh, here we go. L look at look at the value of the shadow now, um, Sarah and, and whoever else was kind of wondering about this. But that combination is uh, uh, Cobalt Teal, Quinacridone magenta. Thank you, Bolson. And, Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, Amazing live chat. already. Fantastic. Thank you both. I learned so much from you. Thank you. Much love to you. Uh -huh. Amazing. Amazing. So, um, yeah, so, so this is really, um, really something that I, that I think about a bunch. So that combination, um, again, cobalt, teal, quinacridone magenta, and ultramarine blue as well. Lift that oh value out with the cremnance white and, yeah. uh, you're good to go. Oh my god, we like we have really we use very similar cutters. Like, I I yeah, use I think awesome. I use almost the same. It's just uh, for the magenta, I generally use quinacridone rose because I, I find that I don't need to be too much on the magenta side. So I, I prefer the rose. It's kind I I use it kind of like an erzurin replacement. Right, 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 right. Yeah, excellent. Th this but man, is, um, hey. I, you're you're so great. I can I can have you here on stream. Like just you're just talking. I can, so, I could just take a break, <laughs> come back later, and just watch the video you later. You're so good at this. You're just entertaining, explaining. Bro, can you, you can tell me to shut you up? You know? Can we time. actually? Can I link you directly to my YouTube channel and you just upload videos for me? Like, is this a thing? Is this a, a thing? I'm pretty sure we can it, make that it, it happen. It could be for the right price, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so so Sarah's come through with another question here. Thanks, Andrew. Cobalt, teal, okay. and magenta. How to darken though makes a beautiful violet. Okay, so again, violet. Play with those two colors, cobalt, teal, and magenta. Cobalt, teal. Together. I wouldn't darken. I wouldn't use cobalt, well, teal to like. I would use cobalt, teal like a yellow, so more like a light color. And to darken, if I need to darken something and still make it look teal-ish, I would use a, some type of phthalo. I don't know about you. That, that's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. You can you can darken using phthalo. Phthalo green is something that I use quite often, and um, uh, permanent crimson as well. But generally, um, with darkening colors in a landscape, like here, for instance, I'll use a combination I can't see. of. 
Burnt Sorry. Umber and Ultramarine Blue. Those two things go together to make a near black. So that's actually, um, when I first started painting, I got those three colors. My father told me that you're, you're allowed to use three colors. You're allowed to use Titanium White, Ultramarine Blue, and Burnt Umber. And then when I kind of learned to master those, then he, he said, all right, I'll buy you two more. I got Yellow Ochre and then Burnt Sienna. So I, I learned from an early age how to use that limited palette. But you can use that cobalt teal mixing it into those some of those combinations because you'll find that cobalt teal is really opaque um but what will happen is you'll be using a particular character of that like it'll 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 tint it a kind of green nature and so one thing that i'm constantly playing with in the landscape is i'm thinking about complementary opposites right so if you know your color theory here then you'll understand a little bit something here about i bore them green. all the time with complementary oh, andrew dude you're but your comp your color theory video ah oh, oh i love that thing i love that it's still years later still comes up as suggested in my uh, in, on my youtube feed it's a beautiful video but you've got your your red green your orange uh, blue and your yellow violet right and so i'm constantly balancing those out as well um there, there's a lot that we could talk about with color, but but again, if I if I was to give you a recipe, Sarah and anybody else, if you if you wanted a recipe for making a kind of purpley violet, what I would do is actually start off just a little bit of Cremnitz white or titanium if that's all you've got, just a little bit of that white. Add some ultramarine to that, so now you've got a nice neutral blue base. Add a little bit of quinacridone to that, and you'll find that that will go really purpley, almost really red. And so you pull that red back into balance by incorporating the cobalt teal, and now you're going to find the right range for a really zing and violet color to use for your landscapes. So white, ultramarine blue, quinacridone, magenta, and cobalt teal. Try that. Enjoy. Um, we have officially yeah. reached the tish zone. Uh <laughs> Apparently, you're in the tish zone already. <laughs> Do you get yeah, hyped like this? Yeah. You have you, you get in the in the <laughs> zone and you, you just um, go on. I mean, you're that. you're made for live streaming on YouTube, man. We have to do this. <laughs> you have we have to do this more often. A couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, man. Well, actually, I, I do. I live stream just about every week. Um, I went traveling here just recently. I went up to the North Island, but I go live just about. Every yeah, for week your tutoring morning. and stuff. Yeah, I, with actually, my I, academy. I'm so. I'm so bad. I didn't put your links, actually. It's still the oh. links from KLC. I, Look, I'm gonna just all you got to do is go to tish.academy, T-I-S-C-H dot academy. Yeah, Some people get, get confused because they're like, oh, tishacademy.com? No, 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 just tish.academy. You know, you know how important links anyway. are. Um, yeah. Okay, here. Cool. Okay, yeah. This is awesome. Oh, there's some, uh, the seashell vanitas was awesome. Yeah, I've just released a YouTube video. It's going live tonight, but my subs over on my email list get that 24 hours ahead of time. Um, and so I, I just put out an hour long tutorial on that uh, for my academy students. That was pretty fun. Uh, yeah, John knows all about the tish side. <laughs> G'day, John. John Kreider's here. Fantastic. Awesome, man. <laughs> Oh, this is so cool. You guys are really nice in, in the chat. This is great. Um, you, I, I was worried about the trolls, bro. I just got to say, uh, but so I, far, I so people... far, we have none. Like they are trolling themselves sometimes. Like we had okay. some weird topics of discussion. I'm, I'm just telling you that like, I'm not going to talk about like, but like they're talking about alien cows, like weird stuff. Aliens, they go that deep, huh? Uh, yeah, phenomenal. they can get silly here and there, but That's I mean, great. They, they mostly behave. They're mostly nice. They, they don't bite. And Good. They're super Good. Nice. Um, I, I get, I, I mean, of course, when it's a free for all uh, online, which I'm not suggesting this is, but uh, sometimes you get some. Um, yeah, you get some interesting ones, but fortunately, all of my academy students and those that follow kind of closely online, beautiful people. I'm forever grateful. Oh, yeah. Them. So love you guys if you're here. Thank you so much. And I know, like, I've got heaps of people here. All right. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just start sketching, man, and we'll talk. I'll, and, and again, I'll, I'll kind of shut up, but I, I'm just going to play with some of this stone paper, right? Just um, <laughs> scribble. Okay, perfect. 
Okay. So what are you working on? Tell me, um, tell me about this painting that you got up on the easel. Is that a kestrel? Um, I kind of saw it at a little bit of a, a distance there, but yeah, I kind of need like to get to work. Painting. Actually, is that what you're suggesting? That I I'm not working enough? I was I was looking Bro, forward to it. just watching <laughs> you do your stuff and just chill and relax, you know. <laughs> well, I'm and now you're saying I have to do brother. something, I... man. <laughs> why do I have guests? They they don't behave anymore. Uh, yeah. I, I'm now I'm now starting to see your strategy here, and I think it's incredible. Oh, yeah. uh, great business uh, decision on your part to have a guest come on board, do all the talking, all the work. Man, I was um, I was expecting the people to switch TV cameras now. for me, but they're not even switch, switching cameras. How am I supposed to exclamation point host to get to my camera, people? I'm not on, I'm not doing my job today. I'm just relaxing right now. <laughs> okay, uh, so if you want, if you switch cameras with the commands, you'll see what I'm working on. It's a still life, but I didn't. Ha I wanted to include birds and and have a still life with birds because the light, that's my big theme at the moment. I want to make like uh, how many like five, six paintings that are kind of in the same vein. So I've been working on still lives here it is, oh, dude. with uh, birds. Uh, because really birds, man. they like people like birds. They usually oh, I love birds. They usually like these types of stuff. So I'm I'm adding. I'm gonna add other elements here. And here is how I add my imaginary effects. So right here is not turned because I'm not working on this part. But I'm gonna have like light effects. With oh, there's going to be some some waves and splashings of source. I don't know exactly. Yeah. For the moment, I'm just working on the birds. So, and because I didn't have birds, I just made, printed them and had a little cardboard bird. So that's how I'm making it at the moment. Really? So that I have like still, you know, the real, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't really like to replace the real feeling of having a still life setup next to my easel. You know, the good old still life. It's just mm. that I want to have like, some imaginary elements. So what I do is usually I print, I add effects later. It's basically, I consider my work to be like a traditional Photoshop, like Photoshop with no computer. Technically, like I, I do, I do Photoshop. Like painters have been doing Photoshop before it was even a thing. If you, if you're thinking Absolutely about it, they have. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Um, that is so cool. Uh, can I can I do a little bit of show and tell as well? Like I I I'll, I'll have to un unhook my headphones for a second here, but let me um, let me switch to this camera because um, you're you're ahead of me a little bit here. I want to show you something. Okay, so and um, yeah, this bird I, I looked it up for you in English. It's in French. It's called G de Chêne. In English, it's I called Eurasian J. Eurasian J. So uh, today uh, I was looking forward to working on this little, like, you know why I chose this bird? Because it has some nice teal, bluish teal, like, spots here. Really super, super great. I don't know how well I'm going to paint this, but we'll, we'll try to do. I'm, I'm going to do my best. What, what is this? Look at this. This is a this is a pheasant. Who's this and, guy? Um, it's a it's a taxidermy pheasant, but I, I I can't take them off the wall. But I also have uh, like a, about a dozen different varieties of duck. I've got a barn owl. I've got a kingfisher. I've got a, a, a I think it's a shrike, um, a, a woodcock, and all of them are from um, from uh, the UK. They actually come from a buddy oh, really? of mine, uh, Mike Norris. Yeah, I was saying doctor. it's funny. You have the same birds that we have in Europe. I was, I was going, to, yeah. I was going to say, but do you have these They're in the old. wild in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, actually, to be honest, yeah, we somebody introduced uh, about 100, 150 years ago, I imagine, uh, pheasants. So you mm. have pheasants on the North Island. You have wild turkey that you find in North America. You have those in the North Island. We've got sambar peafowl or peacocks in the North Island. Um, and oh, the other thing we have, I'm going to get this guy, but I, and before anybody fusses at me, I did not shoot these animals. They are ethically sourced. And the other thing is they're vintage. All right. And they're not, they're not mine. So don't go hate. Them. You know, um, there's a, there's a, some people get there's a, an antiquary shop in where I live. 
and they don't have no. much taxidermized animals. The, the last one they have, though, was pretty epic here, but I didn't purchase it. It was a giant brown bear. No oh, kidding. Dude. Like, they had brown this bear, taxidermized bear. brown bear. I was like, oh, I have to have this for one of my paintings. But I, I was I, like, okay, if I bring this home, my wife is just going to hate me forever. So I, I didn't. <laughs> and by the way, I didn't like, I don't know, what, what am I supposed to do with a brown bear? But I mean, that's cool, right? Have a body here. Like, you have your, <laughs> for the stream, you have a big body here holding your palate. <laughs> what an icebreaker. That, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of squeamish with the whole the whole hunting thing. So I, I yeah, but it, as an artist, this is the thing, you know, having access to um, some of the subject matter, it really does, um, it really does help, you know, kind of help you with that understanding. So I love what you're doing with your still life setup there, but you beat me to it because I've been meaning to do paintings uh, from life of some of this taxidermy. I've actually got one of my, um, like when I, I hired a model years ago and I got her to hold that pheasant and she also was holding Colin the hair. I'm going to go get Colin. Yeah, the only problem like for uh, for me is like the good thing about taxidermy is like it's real. So you get to see the real feathers, the real hair. So this is the texture that you can't get from a printout like what I'm doing. But the good thing about printing them out is like you can have like different positions, which is like it's good enough for me to just make the composition and just have a visual reference like in real life and i can also look at it on my screen the only problem with taxidermy is like you can't move it like you can't just you have this one position it's set otherwise you can have it custom taxidermized like with uh maybe um ch uh chuck um who was this guy nope chuck testa uh, this you know? is uh this is called it's meme. Yeah. It's, uh... okay uh there was a question by nat v any advice on how to make cutters vibrant in oil painting like you get in a concept art digital painting it doesn't exist much in real life reference unless it's an exotic bird first of all like the thing with bird feathers like you know the wonderful bird feathers like peacocks, all these like birds, like when they have really beautiful, usually male colors, it's because of iridescence. So you can't technically replicate the same, you know, like the same visual effect. It doesn't like, it's impossible, like, because it's a light effect. Like, you know, when you have a CD, like you have these little rays of light, like it's iridescence. It's kind of the same idea with the feathers. That's how they get so, so bright. What I would do if you really want to have some super punchy cutters is like, first of all, with paint, you can get some very, very chromatic. Like right now we have some amazing pigments that are super chromatic. Like you, like you don't even need to take it this super far to have something very vibrant. And the, just the quality of your texture, the quality of the brush stroke alone is enough to make the cutter really pop. If it's not enough, like Absolutely. let's say the cutter is like a little bit on the the low side in regards to color, to chroma, what you can do is what I call ultra glazing. It's kind of a, a term that I invented, is like painting something with a cutter and then glazing over it with the same cutter and using something like, you know, something like a phalo, for example, like you can really push it to the extreme with that. Like you, the glaze is like pushing the original color. And if it's the same one, it's like, like almost like bringing the saturation up in Photoshop, if you want. Uh, and not to use it, it, like use it sparingly because it's, it's, it can be strong, especially with a phalo. But like you get something pretty, uh, that, that's awesome. Pretty strong, man. Like that's, that's a really interesting, um, I have to try that. I, I use glazing a bunch. I'm a huge fan of oxides, but normally with glazing, I'm kind of pushing things back down and using it to kind of separate out subjects. <laughs> oh my god! So um, it, that's really cool, man. That's really. Can, cool. can you see the the comment that I highlighted? <laughs> one of your French bears. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Cracks me up. Oh man! Yeah, um, I'll always have regrets for not buying this bear. 
and oh, they had a lion as well. Discord questions. Yeah, I need to go to the Discord. Okay. So people uh, don't really want to see me do anything. So I'm I'm not going to paint. I'm not going to hold a brush in my hand at, at all, I think. But whatever, it's good fun. Okay. So we had questions actually from Cody. Cody is a big Van Gogh fan. Van Gogh fan. Awesome. And the question was, awesome. what's the most beautiful place in the world for you? Uh, I, is he is he is he asking that to both of us? You want to go well, first? No, go first. Like you've seen some amazing places that I think I have never seen. Uh, For everyone in chat as well, everyone in chat, feel free to respond as well. Because I'm awesome. sure we have more well, than one amazing place. Absolutely. For me, um, if you want to get your bucket ready, uh, it's looking into my wife's eyes. It's the most beautiful place ever. Oh, no, but it is. It is. I know. I know. Uh, I. I. I don't know. Like I. That's a really hard one. It's like asking a painter, "What's your favorite color?" I think we are so blessed to live in a world with so much abundant subject matter and there's just some incredible landscapes worldwide and I think just about every country has something unique and inspiring to offer and for me the most beautiful landscape is whatever I, I am inspired to paint next I, I really get into it so whether it's Mount Talbot here in New Zealand or or the Grand Canyon or Monument Valley or a Kimberley landscape um, I'm just taken with it all. Uh, one of my favorite, like, I, I think though, it's, it's a bit of a nonsense answer, I know, but I think if I was to kind of measure it in terms of awe and impact, I don't think I've ever quite been moved the way I the, the way that I was moved when I saw um, the Grand Canyon for the first time. It actually brought me to tears and mm. I embarrassed my father. He was like, what's got, what's wrong with you? I bring you to this place and you're crying. <laughs> just like, dude, I just, I couldn't help it. It was just a, a visceral reaction. Um, that really took my breath away. And I think what it was, was, was the scale. Um, yes, it's pretty. Yes, it's beautiful. But I think what just got me was the sheer scale of it. So first time seeing that I was, uh, it was 2009. And I, I still have this reference sitting there all the way from 2009, done nothing with it. So I really would like to get into that. I, I think a, a landscape course is, is coming on the cards and it's something I'm going to be sharing with my academy students with some American landscapes and some New Zealand landscapes, the best of the best. But um, that, that's my answer. How about you? I don't know. I really like the French Alps because my, my grandfather oh, used to be there dude. and um, like it's, it brings like old memories and it's like breathtaking. I, uh, my grandfather was living in this uh, valley where he had like a view on the Mont Blanc, like, I don't know, Mont, oh, amazing. I, don't, I don't know if you, like his tallest mountain in Europe. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, like, we don't have like super tall mountains compared to maybe what you have, but um, still like, still very, very uh, cool. Um, and I don't know, other than that, like for, but this is not something that I've ever like I like to be there. It's not necessarily something that I feel that I really want to paint. What I'm more yeah. interesting for my painting is like things that seem out of the ordinary. Like sometimes mm. I scroll the news and you have some weird photos. Like you have like this time th there was like a fire, a round fire in the ocean because they had like this gas mining stuff under the ocean and somehow they oh, lighted wow. it on fire. So you had this ring of fire in the water. I really found this like amazing. I, so I would like to visit this place if I wanted to make, you know, a painting scene because I'm always in this, you know, imaginary out of this world kind of idea. I like fire. I like weird lights or, you know, in Turkmenistan, I think, or is it Uzbekistan? They has like this hole in the ground. It's, it's actually a gas mine or a gas, I know this, like this giant hole, they call it like the highway to hell, like it's this hole in the ground, oh, giant, goodness. and it's on fire. It's been on fire for like 40 years because the Soviets like just lit it on fire for some reason. Just this would be my, wow. my kind of, you know, landscape, even though it's like technically it's not a landscape. I think it, it, it has become a, a tourist attraction now. Like they are taking people 
in this desert just to see this hole in the ground with fire. But I don't know. Still, still burning. Actually, the gates of hell. Yeah. This That's is the really, kind of stuff really that I would really find interesting. But I don't know. I just yeah. I can just Google it actually and just find the image. Just but like sometimes my inspiration just comes from like like random images that I found find online. Um, yeah, that's cool, man. Like I, I used to really get into, and I still do to a large extent. I really get into concept art, like what they'll do for for film and television. And I'm not a big TV guy uh, or, or a movie guy anymore. But I, one one thing I was really taken with was matte painting for films back in the day. So you have artists like Peter Ellenshaw who would do who worked alongside Walt Disney. And not the company Walt Disney like that. The actual guy Walt Disney. So when it when it was all first starting, and he was doing paintings for Spartacus and Treasure Island, and you know all these various movies. And so whenever you would have like a fantastic landscape that doesn't exist, it was made up by the writers or the story. You would have to have somebody to paint that physically. And then what they'd do is they would, they'd paint that on a sheet of glass. They'd scratch away the glass and have an area in that glass of live action where they'd project into the scene the actors acting in the movie. But it always used to blow my mind that it was somebody who actually had their their job was to paint that. And so a lot of the old movies that you saw, um, and they stopped doing this, I, I think, uh, late '90s. But a lot of movies that you would see even through the '80s, '70s, '60s, uh, and and earlier would be um, paintings. And so, you know, the original Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, paintings, you know, all, all of this stuff. Indiana Jones, there are paintings. I just thought that was the coolest thing. So I, I love, man, I, I love that 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 um, kind of imaginative mix of, of of subject matter that you're incorporating into your work, Florent. I I think that's really cool, man. Um, I haven't really played with it much, but I I do want to do some stuff that is kind of like 17th century imaginative realism. There's a, a Dutch artist that I'm particular taken, particularly taken with. His name's Melchior de Hondekorter, and I'm butchering the pronunciation of that. But uh, if you do a search on that, on that name, Melchior de Hondekorter, and Hold on. H -O, H -O -N -D -E -C -O -E -T -E -R? Oh my god. Uh, anyway, so birds in the landscape. So he'll have like these all these different birds that he's painted over some sort Pond of uh, ruin. I might I might just um Oh yeah, I've got it. Chat. It's suggesting to me. Melchior de No, I don't have it. De Coter. I, I think this is it. I'm gonna hit it hit up the chat. Oh Melchior yeah. De I, I, I probably I probably Pond missed Cherry. That, but it says Melchior Pondicherry, but I don't know. Maybe no. that'll come up, or maybe it's a D-E instead of a D-apostrophe. Um, somebody will know who I'm talking about. Um, I'm terrible with the spellings and pronunciations, forgive me. Ah, uh, Femox, thank you very much. Thank you. I wasn't that, I, I was pretty close, wasn't I? I was pretty close. Uh, yeah. No. Not no? really, not really, not, not to be mean, but... It... <laughs> no, you're way off. <laughs> uh, Jim, no, Jim's got it. What are you talking about? I was, I was, no, Phoenix, well, thank you for backing that's good. up there, the, the, Well, says you're correct. Okay, chat, so good that, job, that, chat. That, okay, so we thank have Thank you, chat. Uh, okay, can I get something? <laughs> I'm trying to pull it on so, screen. So if, hold um, on. If some people just, uh, if they're following along here, they just want to know what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, as you can see, what I'm doing is, is establishing some dark values first. When I'm working on this stone paper, I like to use a 2H or an H first, lay in some very light value, kind of get the general form in value. I'm not worried about the cleanness of my edges or any line work at this stage. It's just kind of blocking in major zones of, of tone uh, and, and getting that value structure established. But when we're working with drawing, you know, we're always dealing with value here. So again, my my lighter values are going to be existing in the background so i want to keep those tones nice and light so the shadows here can't get too dark but as we come forward we get progressively darker because again if i'm focused on my line shape tone colors out we don't need to worry about that and edge right then i can create that convincing sense of form depth light and material 
what's the form here? Well, you have light defining the form in the landscape. You can see it here with the highlights, the way it kind of clings to things, shines off things. You get a bit of reflected light. You can see clearly three dimensionality there. Uh, the depth is established by the tone. The light, of course, you have light against dark, dark against light. That'll establish your value structure and give you a sense of lighting throughout. And then the material, that's going to come down to the fine line work at the end. Boom. That's exactly what I'm talking about, bro. Look at that painting. So so that's 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 my jam right there. I don't have a stuffed monkey or a squirrel, but uh, but I can work on that. Uh, but that I, I just think that's so cool. Isn't that badass? That's so badass. Yeah, it's badass. I, I, so 17th century, if I'm not mistaken. So do you think he was working from taxidermized? Oh yeah. As well? oh yeah and so as you study his work you'll see multiple paintings he has the same birds and the same poses wow, okay again. yeah but one thing he was able to do was he was able to uh you know get get a sense of life in them and i love it like he's using species from all over the globe i mean i can see sulfur crested cockatoos i saw a brolga crane brolgas are found in australia in that one down to the bottom in the center he's got a cassowary found in far north queensland or papua new guinea I've actually seen cassowary in the wild when I was living in Queensland. Uh, this way? He's got European species, American species, tropical Australian species. Go figure. But I just think this guy is, uh, you know, Yeah, incredible. pretty well. And I, I, I love that style of, of defining form with light. And this is one thing. Can I just say, a lot of us today are afraid to use dark tone. We're afraid to go too dark. Now, of course, in the con a context of, of a landscape, you know, we, we do need to preserve those dark tones from the immediate foreground. But in a still life, dark tone is what gives rise to our light. So I, I just, the, the light explodes out of those paintings because they're predominantly dark, but they've, he's preserved a moment of, of lightness and it just causes this, this life to come through the canvas. I love it. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm talking too much again, bro. So you just shut me up and, and let's let's talk more about what you're doing. Back to work, Florence. Yeah, no problem. I'm trying to keep <laughs> up with chat. They're just so hyped. They're just... Um, honestly, can you guys just do a live every Friday? Well, we, we could. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm uh, totally open to doing it again, man. I, I love hanging out and talking about art. And it, as I said, when we were talking off, off camera, just sorting out the tech stuff, um, I've been following you for years and years, bro. And um, it, as soon as I got that email come through, I said yes immediately. I was just like, yeah. Uh, my wife uh, picked it up. She's like, oh, there's this guy here. I said, well, what's his name? I was like, oh, no way. Yeah, tell him, yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing that. That's cool. So your, your wife so, is helping you with your art stuff? She's part of your business yeah, or so she has a my, separate my, um, job? Rachel, uh, Rachel's her name. She she helps me with uh, some customer service. She's um, also helps me with some correspondence. Mm -hmm. She's been in the background for the last couple of years because she's full-time mother. Uh, mm -hmm. to our, our beautiful son and she's a wonderful mom and so that's really taken a lot of her time and attention so i do have some other help with with some uh, some of the things but you know i'm shooting all the video i'm doing all the live streams and stuff and whenever somebody sends me a dm on social media like instagram or through the the um the academy mm -hmm. that's me actually responding to those so i still do a whole bunch myself you, you have to um, I never wanted to be replaced with somebody else or a bot or anything like that. So that's me doing my correspondence there. But over over email, there's there's a bit of volume of. of yeah, yeah, so I, get, I totally it get it. Like it's yeah. like it's impossible to make give a proper response to everybody. Like or just filter, just filter the you know the flow of uh, requests that you can get. So she's Absolutely. like a sort of a chat GPT in real life. With like love and 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 being a, a, a person like that still uh, be is with you like through the like it's not like you can you can't turn her off I guess that's what I or can <laughs> like yeah 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 no it's 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 sometimes it's nice to talk to a real human being so we we, we try we try. Um, uh, can, can we reach total epicness and get 200 likes today for Andrew? Oh, wow. Hey, for both. Come on. Let's do it. Honestly, guys, just do a live every Friday. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> That's so nice. Uh, yes. I'll hit yes. I've got a dialogue box that's come up. 
Uh, there we go. Yeah, cool. The, the darker, the better. Tish. <laughs> um, ivory black is blue. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. So uh, I've, I've played with this recently as well for my fundamentals course. We had a um, demonstration using the Zorn palette, um, also known as the Apelles palette. Um, so have you worked much with that? With uh, those I, that have you played with that form? I, uh, I made a video, a hate video about it. I got some bad oh, feedback. Okay, hold on, let's, oh, you got some hate about it? Let's talk. No, oh, no, man. I hate the Zorn palette. And I, I made yeah, a video about how I hate it. And okay. no, nah, no. Nah, <laughs> but I was kind of bashing it. Like, why would anybody want, not want to use blue? Like, and I was like, yeah, I don't get yeah. it. And or yeah. I, no, actually, I, I was nicer than that. I said, OK, it works for some people. It's just really not for me and if you want to be able to paint anything you shouldn't waste your time with it honestly and i was like okay but if you want to just train like let's say skin tones maybe but yeah i don't see the point otherwise yeah well i i think i think it's interesting right so for me if i was to use that paint that palette professionally i mean it could work but it'd be like having one hand tied behind your back going into box with mike ty let me get very far but maybe i'm being a little bit mean but what no. i love about it as an exercise is that you are limiting your options so you really have to explore what color does yeah and the really interesting thing about it um from that comment was ivory blue ivory, ivory black as blue you'll recognize that the real coolness or the inherent nature of the color is you mixing it with and you'll realize else. why you need actual blue once you've started <laughs> trying to well, make no, no. <laughs> ivory black no, 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 passes no, no. blue. <laughs> well, no, because the interesting thing is, is that your coolness is given by color relationship. Mm -hmm. so could you do this? This could you do this landscape with the Zorn palette though? Heck no! Oh, okay. <laughs> Where's my teal? Where's so, my magenta? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, Odd Nerdrum, for instance. I mean, Odd, Odd Nerdrum's a, a phenomenal painter. Um, and he uses the Apelles palette. Or yeah, that's, that's palette brown. Palette. That's what I call the brown school. And actually, I think yeah. I mentioned it. This is an actual legit school in the history of art, like where everything looks kind of brownish. So if it's your style, like it's, it's kind of, you know, elegant, very sober, kind of feels like, uh, like Dutch masters. It does feel very Dutch. And yeah. yeah very sober um not super modern looking but you know elegant at least like it's like having a black dress like always works but it doesn't fit like for any type of uh, purpose like good analogy yeah i i hear you man i hear you i i, I don't know now that i've said that um I, i'm starting to think i i don't know i i think don't 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 go hating me uh, uh, hopefully we can have another live stream, but I, I might try a, a full-on still life just using the Apelles palette. And I might even try something. Oh, here, now I'm really going to do it. I'm going to try and paint iridescence using those four colors. <laughs> That'd be fun. I wonder if you could do it. I wonder if you could do it. Probably not. Anyway. Uh, Zorn is not good for seascapes. You know what, Jim? I, I think when looking at Andrew Zorn paintings, I actually think, you know, for a lot of his landscapes, you know, where he would do some of the nude figures it, bathing in the water out, outdoors in full sunlight, I'm convinced he used green and blue. Some of the interior scenes, though, it looked like he was using those four colors. But you can't for a minute tell me he wasn't using blue in some of his landscape work. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Um, uh, I think uh, Powell says, I think the Zorn palette works best for portraits. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. Yeah, it's mostly that. Yeah. Well, but... Actually, I, I did make a full demo with the Zorn palette for the, the, the purpose of the video. And I, I have to say I had fun. So I recognized in the video that it can be a good exercise. It's good practice. Like you can have fun using it and like learn actually a lot of things. But I wouldn't advise anybody to just rely on it long term. Just like Zorn himself, like he didn't do that. Like you have paintings of him with paintings of his uh, with just like green and like stuff like that like that's clearly he was using other pigments when needed just 
he wasn't like yeah. uh, dogmatic about it and like a lot it of people they like online you know like online criticism like people can be on the dogmatic side every time yeah. they can like they oh, want to be sure. super into like they've heard that sure. the zorn palette is good and their mentor is saying that it's good so they want to just defend it with their lives so you know well, I, th I think we can get too too obsessed with things that, that resemble rules, right? And, and I, I fall into this with my own work. I, I would have these things that would start to be rules. And then I'd find the more I spoke to other artists and the more I was exposed to, to different ideas, yeah. those rules would begin to bend and then give way. And I'd work out and realize there were better ways of doing things. I, I, I think that also just in terms of the state of the art world today um and when i say art world i mean the world that we're all very much involved in i'm not talking about some snobby academia oh yeah but the art world when you jump on instagram you hit that little magnifying glass uh you know search function that's the art world today there is some dynamite badass painters working today all over the world and for everybody that's slinging paint out there, there's a new, unique way of doing things. I think I think there's so many different approaches that have so much to offer that if you paint yourself into a corner, pun intended, then sometimes it can be very difficult to get out of that trap. So, you know, play with a little something, try a little something different, see how you like it. And and that that's how you end up circling in on those, those methods and modes that work for you. Um, so right now, like I, I, if I was so set in my ways, I would never have tried to work on copper. I would never have tried to play with layering and try new family of mediums made by gambling. I would just still be using liquid, doing my same old, same old. And so I, I think it's important to shift it up. You know, I'm about to go full yeah, drawing totally. mode, uh, portraits and, and, and various subjects and still lives. Uh, done in charcoal and and done with you know some compressed charcoal toned paper chalk conti um and who knows what i'm done with that i might even try pastel so I, I think it's important to experiment and play right sure it's just like some people like the way i've seen them talk about the zorn palette it feels more like kind of a a cult like they have this <laughs> ideology like say, a cult? they want to defend their <laughs> like their stuff they they really want to <clears throat> just yeah i don't know and i i don't know I, I i'm curious to see those paintings from those people who gave me like hate for not praising the zorn palette like everybody else it's like show me what you do really just just for a moment show me what you do because i'm not sure that your art is really that perfect with like you say oh it's perfectly fine okay maybe just show me because i'm i'm not convinced mm -hmm. and I I I, I I I i know that zorn like zorn himself he was an amazing painter it's not necessarily because of the palette it's because of like what most people like about zorn is the brushwork like the the texture of the the the, the paint and maybe the simplicity of the pa the palette led to like more focus on that but like Who's to say he couldn't have made the same stuff with a more extended palette? Mm. You know, and maybe there's something else going on here. I mean, I don't understand the full context, but but maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe some of these artists, they were painting this way because of access to materials. I mean, not to forget, like a lot of these artists are working in, at a time where uh, thalocyanine or, or quinacridone was not available. And so we have a lot of modern um, pigments at our disposal, but maybe some of these artists didn't have that. So they would have had maybe I lapis think lazuli. In the, I think they, in the case of Zorn, expensive. I think in the case of Zorn, it's actually kind of the the opposite. It was kind of counterculture of his time. Like it was the time of the impressionists, and all the impressionists were coming up with, you know, the newest pigments. They were like today doesn't sound new to us, like but they were all using like the new innovation. In, you know chemistry right. producing new pigments and yeah. the impressionists were using them like a lot and actually Zorn was yeah, kind of right. taking it like no no I, I, he was more like you know the the guy who just doesn't follow the trend but like he's like more you know uh, hipster oh, I like him even more now he was like an, a hipster <laughs> of the of the impressionist era he was like no no I'm not following this and I'm going to something even darker and more 
brown oh, that's it man I, I love him even more now hey you know who is one of my favorite artists though from from that kind of era um different part of the world spain but it, it, joaquin sorolla i mm. love his paintings man I oh don't yeah but there's like so it. much more color in there you're not talking oh, about yeah. the same oh dude yeah no different different uh but yeah just speaking of somebody from that era just oh, amazing work uh, but there was a cool uh, cool question here i don't want to miss it from alan voss um uh -huh. and i want to hear what you have to say about this uh, uh, because okay. uh it was uh, i've lost it now but it was uh do you ever use um fibonacci numbers or fibonacci sequence in okay your paintings? yeah uh, here it is fibonacci N never in my case in your i use the rule never. thirds no because i i find that the thirds they they are similar enough for what i want like i'm never like okay. pinpoint using the fibonacci points and golden rule and stuff so the thirds right. and center lines kind of work well enough for me right like okay. it's too much math for me it's like i'm mostly when i'm working you know organically and like moving my my composition my elements around Usually yeah. I end up around the thirds, center lines, median lines, and like basic geometry, but like... Very cool. It's not based on on uh, numbers, mostly on... Fair enough. Yeah, intuition. I hear you, man. I hear you. I, um, I, I've used it a bunch in the past, but I, I am kind of veering away from it now, just going for a more intuitive process, but I, I tend to incorporate those numbers now automatically in my paintings so when i measure yeah I put a grid or an overlay on i find oh fine, yeah okay, sometimes look, you don't even know some... about it but like it, it yeah like what works is generally that is usually this is why i go with the flow and sometimes like if somebody yeah. analyzes it like retroactively they will find out that okay this was actually golden number or similar ish like you're never really trying to get exactly it's not like GPS coordinates, so and sometimes like people try to push because I've seen some, you know, some books on like master paintings analyzed, and they trace lines all over the place. But some of these lines they don't make sense. Like they don't follow anything. They just want to like make sure that oh yeah it has the golden ratio. Well, really it doesn't. I'm not sure. Like. Like this, yeah. all, a, a little bit of the arm is on the same line, okay, but why is that a golden ratio? Like, for example, well, like we'll this line that I have on my painting, I don't know, I just went for this diagonal, but I, I don't know what angle, what number it is. I just went for something that looks geometrically cool, but I don't yeah. know. I didn't Let measure. Let me tell you why that line works for me. I, 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 I appreciate that because you got your bird flying in from a certain direction, but one thing that echoes that movement and brings more flow and a dynamic energy into the painting is you, the bird's flying down, but the light is actually traveling in the same direction. So it, it gives even more force to that painting. Then you've anchored your composition with the bird in the lower right. And I think it's got a really nice flow and, and, and to that. So, you know, your your composition method really feels intuitive, but you've got the eye, man. You've got the eye. So I think it works beautifully. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, just throwing that in the mix. But um, And sometimes, yeah, you know, it. off center. So I don't know, this straight line here, it's off center. Yeah. And sometimes that's what you need. It's, Perfect. it's like yeah, a absolutely. little, you know, distortion, just like with guitar, you want some distortion. Otherwise it just sounds too clean. Exactly. It's kind of the same. Exactly. Um, I, so, if anybody's wondering, um, for if I if I may uh, just go on a bit of a tangent here, but if everybody's wondering, we have questions from the Discord, is... Andrew. I'm. I, we have. Oh, okay. we, we still have a lot of questions, but can, can, oh, all right. Beg your pardon. Is, is your tangent okay. like how long is your tangent? It's, it's, no, it's relate. It's uh, it's going to be about thirty five minutes. Is that okay? okay. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm okay. No, you know, I've done. Shorts. You know what I've done? I know you had made you you had your twenty four hour painting challenge, and I <laughs> I personally have done a twelve hour live stream. So I think you have to cut it in in half. Like you can't do a twenty four hour live stream. But I I think we can go around the clock. I think okay. we, we can. We, we might be able to. Yeah. <laughs> we might be able to. Um, 
But I, I just just on the golden ratio, just for a second, if anybody was yeah. wondering about that and how that relates, because we're throwing names and things out there. So if you're if you're new to this as a concept, I'll give you the elevator pitch really quick and I'll see if I can sum this up in less than a minute. But basically your Fibonacci sequence is a sequence that goes one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen. Uh let's see, we go Jim, help me out here, bro. I'm I'm not the math guy. Uh 13, 21, uh uh, uh 34 and then 55 and then so on and so forth so basically each next number in the sequence is a sum of the previous two does that make sense so you, you start off with zero then you have one and add those two together you get one add those two together you get two add those two together you get three so on and so forth where it's really interesting and how it relates to the golden number and by the way the golden ratio states one is to 1.618. So you have a relationship between two things where one thing is bigger than the other thing by a proportion of one is to 1.618. As you get higher in that Fibonacci sequence, if you divide the one number with its immediate next adjacent number, you start approaching that, that, that ratio of one is to 1.618. And so when we say, how do we divide our composition or compose according to that ratio, we're simply dividing up the cam canvas. Well, I am, Florence not doing that, of course, but that's cool, uh, rule of thirds. But we're dividing up that canvas in, in terms of that ratio. So how would you do that? Well, let's just say this is my canvas right here. I'll, we'll just get this sheet of card out here for a second. Let's just say this is my canvas, right? I'll turn it this way so you can see it. I'd wanna take my ta tape measure here and I'd want to I'd want to measure across, and I would want to go. Okay, what is this? It's, it's roughly uh, twelve by by fourteen. So I would I would measure across here, and I'd go. Okay, that's fourteen inches. What's fourteen times 0.618? And I'd end up with a line somewhere around here. Boom. And then I'd go. Okay, measuring from the other way. Boom. And then I'd measure in from the top. Okay, what's twelve times six point six one eight? and then measure in from the top and the bottom. I'm going very quick here. Now, when you're using it in composition, where those lines converge, you've got a wonderful place to put some subject matter. Don't use all of them. Normally what I'll do is I'll use one. And if I'm painting the landscape, what I'll do is I'll say, this is a great place to put the peak of my mountain about that line. And this is a really great place here to balance it with a tree. So normally I'll balance out a couple of different uh, points there. Whereas rule of thirds, which is what photographers use and it works immediately, is just outside those lines. So rule of thirds will come here just outside of the golden ratio. But if you want to find the golden ratio really quickly, just go five eighths. Now, why would that be necessary? Why five and eight? Well, remember five and eight are actual Fibonacci numbers. There are numbers in that sequence. So if you divide up five eighths or divide this by eight, divide that the length and height by eight, then count across five, draw your lines there, then you'll find the pretty close to the to the golden ratio. There you go. That was my elevator pitch. I think I did it in less than two minutes. How's that? Oh my God, look at this. We have the math is, is all making sense here reaching through the matrix <laughs> can you see on the screen oh my god yes, yes. it's happening oh. oh i love it i love it <laughs> oh i might i might be neo i might be the one. Oh my god i, I might be art neo over here <laughs> <laughs> funny funny oh that's cool but I, I appreciate any any opportunity to uh, to geek out about art. Oh so yeah, that was cool with me. Like, I geek out as well. Um, uh, Basalm says, "Yeah, you lost me with the math. Don't worry. It's it's you know, take a minute. It's it's good fun anyway. But <laughs> but the, the other thing I'll, I'll just mention on that, why why use it at all? Well, here's where it gets really cool. If you go to ventricles on seashells, you'll notice that they grow, most of them for the most part, at a ratio of, of one is to 1.618. Pineapples have scales that, that uh, re, um, relate to the Fibonacci sequence. So there's a ratio again. A lot of flower petals grow in this. Yeah, way, it's crazy. But it's also in the human face. This is really interesting on the human face, right? If you, if you, and, and this is how we find people that are that, that we'll all agree on as being conventionally beautiful. I mean, yes, the media, movies, television set beauty standards, all right? It is what it is. Like that's why we kind of recognize, oh, that's beautiful because there's something cultural that's going on. 
I believe that everybody has their own inner beauty that comes through. Right? I'm not trying to mm, mush it. Well, there are, there are. It's proven that there are actual objective features that make, like you know, even like with babies, they they can just f yeah. like be like they they feel uh, some. I don't know. It's not attraction for a baby, but like they, you know, they recognize certain facial like symmetry. Yeah. It's very weird. Absolutely, absolutely. So symmetry is one, but if you take the, the face and you divide it up, it, it turns out that people who have that ratio in their face, uh, they're, they're the ones that we tend to agree on as being more more beautiful than, than not. But also uh, over the human body, if you take your hand, for instance, this bone, uh, this bone is bigger than this bone by a proportion of one is to 1.618. This one to this one by one is to 1.618. The hand, one is to 1.618. Yeah, go put the matrix up there on the screen again. Oh, yeah, I have uh, to. Your, you, <laughs> the, the dimension from the top of your head to your navel is one, and from your navel to the bottom of your feet is 1.618. It gets spooky. So it's everywhere in nature, it's even in us, but it turns out that when they kind of found this and discovered this, they thought that they found like the kind of the building blocks of nature and, and the world. The ancient Greeks started then to celebrate this and put it into their architecture. So the Parthenon is built on this ratio. And then during the Renaissance, which is the revival of all of these classic ideas, you know, people like Da Vinci were putting it into their paintings. Uh, check out the painting by Da Vinci called The Annunciation. Maybe somebody could put that in the live chat. We could have a look at that. The golden ratio is all over you can recognize it immediately yeah it's crazy. it's yeah. crazy so is it overkill do you need to do it no i i tend to go by eye now but it's something it's something that i enjoy i i think i think it's interesting uh, to play with uh, i put it in the milford sound painting for instance um that, i that think the the follow-up question was actually uh interesting it makes it means then isn't there four ideal places do you just use one of them isn't this the anatomy of the square basically and this is where where actually I would come up with, you know, use distortion and you know, unbalance to be, because you if obviously if you use all the four ideal places, it doesn't work. And if you actually well, I, I, with, with okay. what Andrew is talking about, you are going to end up with some sort of a spiral, so it will not fall yes. back on the same places all the time. But in my okay. case, so, what I would so. say is just use one for your main elements and then try to use balance and imbalance try to decide on one focus point usually that's yeah. what works the best find I, one yeah i like the, the the main one and avoid the center this is what i i, I said this in one of my composition videos yeah. is dead center is dead like it's it's not it's not Boom. a good place to put your well, most so. important you know features exactly right so so for those of the, the, the for those that are paying attention I, I, I put this over here and I said, I'll use this as a line. I call this a harmonic division, but this as a line to place a subject matter. Notice it's not exactly on the on that that um, intersection. I exactly. had to put it again. But I'll balance Sorry. it out with one more. But if I'm honest, and this is I didn't want to overcomplicate it, but we have another space that's defined here. I would go ahead and divide that up with the golden ratio, divide that up with the golden ratio, divide that further so I get a bit further out. So you have these ones in the center. If you use all of them, you are going to come up with a fried egg, the dead center. You're going to come up with something that, that is not the golden ratio. So what I would do is I would use one and then I'd use another one, and mm -hmm. then I'd use another yeah. one, and I'd create a triangle. That's how you create dynamic yeah. harmonic tension in a painting. So you're not you're not using the center necessarily. You're balancing it some way. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't take into account your values, your contrast, how you're drawing the eye. Oh yeah, pictures. just talking about shapes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So so it, it's fun. Uh, yes, you can obsess with it, and I think, oh no. I got paper. I got some highlighter in my. Uh, on my oh my god! Paper. Uh, that won't come out. Uh, it looks like I'm just this invent a rock. <laughs> just make make a rock pop on top of it and try. What a blunder! I'm glad your uh, selfie view there, Florent, is is uh, covering this. Oh yeah! Look at this sketchbook. It's perfect. That is. I, <laughs> I am. I am ticked off about that. All right. Okay, we, we, we have to go. We have to go to the next questions. 
Okay, let's uh, do it. Let's do it. Let's get off that one. Okay. Do you, I know that you have used a lot of liquid and you talked about it. Do you recommend liquid for every painter? I don't, personally. Uh, I, 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 no, I don't recommend it for every painter. I recommend it for a particular effect and application. I do recommend it to, to beginners. Who yeah, I would recommend that everybody work. tries because like get a small yeah. bottle and try. Personally, I, I can't work with it because it feels too much like jello to me. It feels too transparent okay. and translucid. But I know that yeah. some, for some people, they really want this flow. This like, I mean, it's impossible to describe, but really like there's nothing like it. Uh, so um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I think um, and I, I'm, I'm generally a big fan of alkyd resins, but I think the issue with any medium, no matter what we're talking about, is that people use too dang much of it. Um, we tend oh, to yeah. abuse it. That's the and trap of liquid. Can, if you use too much yeah. of it, it's like gets yeah. slippery. It feels like I, like absolutely. being on ice skate, ice skating on your on your canvas. And that's um that's quite uh that's that can be quite dangerous. Now that I've done this, I'm going to get a bit more adventurous with my uh, drawing. Now that I've ruined it with highlighter, how oh, that's <laughs> crazy. All for the live stream. How, what what were like? We can see it on screen, so you're good. But how does it work if you try to um, to draw on top of it? Does it cover it, or is it like just a mess? It makes it a dark purple. Uh. <laughs> I can glaze over my highlighter with graphite, and I can make a darker purple. Oh well, I might get crazy with this one. Do some mixed media with some highlighter. Why not? Um, I forgot what the question was. Liquid? Oh, mediums. We we're talking about mediums. Yeah. So I, I would not recommend that for every painter. No, but I do. I do talk to my students about that. And I do recommend it for just starting out. But I think, yeah, you want to observe a particular rule. I, I keep saying this, and, and this is where I will be a little bit dogmatic about a rule. And that is use no more than one part medium to three parts paint. That will keep you from getting into that slippery territory. And, and that slippery again slippery can you repeat because it's actually one of the questions tell them your ratio yeah. of liquid to paint well okay so at the most so it's like the speed limit right mm -hmm. you don't uh thank you john john's come up there tell them your ratio so it's like the speed limit if the speed limit says 100 you don't want to do 120 and it, but you can do 90. so so at the most one part medium to three parts paint one mm -hmm. part medium to three parts. So that's thirty-three percent. Um, yeah, twenty-five percent. Twenty-five percent. So one part to three. Oh, parts, okay. So yeah, you don't count. Yeah, because okay, so I was like one yeah. third to two thirds. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I so usually thirds, think like whenever I recommend, much. like so, never more than like for oil. If you use pure oil, I recommend never going like never adding like if you already have like a paint tube. There's already oil in it. So I, I said never reach more than 10% of the volume of paint, like if you just use like oil, like pure oil. So like... That's really good, man. That's, that's, see, that's even more conservative than my approach. That's really good. That, so that will keep you out of trouble. But uh, like the, the liquid, the liquid is not just oil. So you can, like if you add a solvent, you can add a little bit more. So I would go for a medium, the medium that I use normally. I would go up to 25% of the volume, mm. but like more than that, it just, for me, it just gets too, too liquid. So I, I don't want any of that. And so what medium are you using normally? What's your, I what's use your stand oil and mirror spirits. Stand. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah 25, I, I, I've been 25% max. With, um, been playing with a bunch of uh, gambling products recently, and I'm, I'm enjoying some of their alkyds. They've got a, a solvent-free gel. They've got a slow dry, a light uh, gel um, or a light medium, and, and I'm really enjoying some of those so far. Uh, they do behave a bit differently than liquid. Rob, Rob is is I, asking, I, can you use one part paint, seven parts liquid for glazing? No. So, so, so this is where the danger territory would, would, would occur. So, so normally people, and especially when starting out, they get this idea in their head that glazing is like, uh, drowning sort of the paint wash. in fluid. Yeah, exactly. And, it's and not, not, it's not just about having a transparent is. pigment. You can glaze Bingo. with no medium. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Almost. Right. And so this is, 
this is where your transparent colors are really going to come into play here. And when you start playing with the good stuff, you'll recognize that there is a distinct difference between transparency and opacity. I mean, when you're using white, uh, a lot of people think, well, white's white, right? Well, no, Kremnitz white or lead-based white is, is incredibly transparent when compared to titanium. So I would um, highly recommend getting some good stuff and just playing with some transparent pigments. You'll notice that ultramarine is semi-opaque, whereas cobalt teal is opaque. Uh, cadmium red is opaque, whereas permanent crimson is relatively transparent. Um, and so playing with these yeah. color relationships uh, is, that's, is that's really one of the things, like, a lot of people blame me for saying, well, you should use a limited number of pigments, but still, I have this list of 15 to 20 pigments that I recommend. And they're like, yep. well, I thought you were just saying about like, you don't need too many pigments. Yeah, but sometimes you just need some transparency and you can't get a transparent yeah. a, a glaze, a red glaze with cadmium red. You will not have a glaze with cadmium red. Or yeah, you have some weird yeah. cadmium that I don't know about. I know maybe a, a replacement yeah. that's more transparent. It's not the point. It's just yeah. like pigments, they have like, you can't, uh, you can go beyond their physical, like, capacities, like, they just behave a certain way. So I do have, like, several options in my list, and it's because of this. It's yeah. also because of sometimes, you know, the drying time is just uh, a problem that you might want to uh, take in consideration. Like, a lot of things. Exactly. You don't just use the pigments just because, you know, it's a nice cutter. Sometimes it's a nice cutter, but it dries fast. And sometimes it's a nice cutter, but it's opaque, and you want opaque. And so it's more complicated it's, than that, exactly. than what it seems. But Exactly right. Yeah, look, I, I'm with you 100% on that. I, I think sometimes it's great to have options. And if you're going to limit your palette, you're doing it for a reason. I mean, there, there's, there's a certain something that you're going for. Um, so I, I prefer to have options. Generally, my extended palette, if I'm working on a... Uh, a big landscape and I, I need that versatility of these different effects with color it might approach 20 tubes of paint out on the palette uh, so question thing serves does a does purpose. flake white turns yellow first of all everything turns yellow right it's like it's time this is called time like your microwave is going to turn yellow your everything is going to like vanish with time so yeah and what turns yellow is not the the it's not technically the pigment, but mostly the oil. So if you have, a, mm -hmm. like, look at all, the, most of the whites, they don't have linseed in them for the most part. Uh, because, Sapphire. yeah. So what I, for, for example, I, the, the linseed is still an important uh, oil if you want some nice drying time for the bottom layers, for example. Uh, m most of them, they're using safflower. What I do is I have like I, uh, Michael Harding. They make whites with that have like you have both options. You can get the linseed oil or the safflower oil. So what I do is I use the linseed for the bottom because the linseed it there is a risk that it will yellow, and it's mostly the linseed will, that will yellow, and the safflower is yellows but less. It's like less noticeable, and that's. After that, like everything yellows, it's just like it's normal. Like everything, like all oil paintings will crack, all oil paintings will just deteriorate with time. It is true, sadly, but you might be able to. I don't get know, it's the life, it's like aging. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. But you, you might be able to get the uh, the great great grandchild of, of Baumgarten uh, restoration to restore your paintings if you're that worried about it. Uh, but one thing I, I think, if we just stick to a few kind of guidelines in a way, and, and yeah, and sure, you can to, minimize. To yeah, observe. Mm. Yeah, you can minimize. You, you observe best practice, and you'll definitely minimize. I mean, we still get to enjoy Rembrandt and and you know Zorn and Zoroy and all these great. Yeah, it's all yellowed past, compared to what it but was. It has yellowed. But it's still it's still perfectly and with a bit of conservation and restoration, mm -hmm. it it uh, they still look they still inspire me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Some people are yeah. like I don't know. It's a weird thing. Have you noticed that like a lot of 
uh, newcomers, they are super conservative in how their painting has to be super archival. Like, they don't even know how to paint yet, but they are so worried that it might turn out that the painting in like a hundred years from now is not going to survive. Like, it's, it's very philosophical yeah. and existential if you think about it. Like, why do we make art? But it is like the first worry. Like, first of all, learn how to paint and you, you can worry about that later. Like, it's technical stuff. Like, most of the stuff that we have today is more or less, like, good. Like, they made this in factories and, like, it's yeah. all, like, the, the paint that we get is pretty nice, like, compared to what they had pretty in good. the past. And what they had in the past was not optimal and still, it's still looking pretty damn good. So, I think we're fine. Exactly. Shouldn't, you shouldn't exactly. worry too much. It shouldn't be your first worry if you're just starting. Well, I, I, I personally, I didn't start worrying about it until I started selling. And when I started selling my work, that's when I got um, a little bit, yeah, in the weeds with it because I, I just didn't want to lead a customer astray and have something that was going to fall apart. And I have seen paintings that have fallen apart within yeah. a matter of I wouldn't say, uh, for months, example, you know? for zinc white, in the case of zinc white, I would strongly advise to try, try to avoid it if possible. Like, you, you don't necessarily need zinc white. Yeah. And if you use, you have to be super cautious. Like, not for underpainting, not for... Like, there's a lot of, uh, not with an acrylic ground. I mean, there's tons of stuff with zinc. If you're a beginner, just avoid it. And mm. if it's just, you know, your titanium white tube has some zinc in it, it's generally not a problem because like the proportion is like, it's like generally less than 5%. So you have so little of it that it's not gonna, it's like only if it's an entire layer, let's say. But like there's been some studies, just if you want to nerd out, just go look through that. If you're just studying, just if it worries you, just don't use zinc white, like pure zinc white, I mean. Yeah, I, I, I would recommend if you haven't gotten into the work of Virgil Elliott, um, I, I would recommend looking at some of his materials if you are obsessed with this, but I'm going to give you a bit of warning some of the material might keep you up at night uh, because it, it, some of it, in my opinion, can seem a little bit dramatic. Don't get me wrong. I love Virgil. I think uh, I think he's a dude. He's been on my podcast a couple of times. Um, and so I would really uh, yeah, recommend following the traditional oil painting Facebook page that's, uh, that he hosts. Um, and he even has a book by the same name. So check him out. But if you really want to get obsessed about this, but again, I think we can tend to obsess uh, but if we just follow a few basic guidelines, yeah, I agree it's not with that you much, far, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, just sure. I would avoid the zinc. That, that's the only thing that I really don't like using because I think it's quite problematic. Mind you, uh, there's a couple of companies now that claim, I don't believe it, but they claim that they've worked out a way to make the zinc permanent. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that one, but I, I'm willing maybe to I don't know. I, I, I haven't done the research, I'm just saying, just. I never used zinc before before I learned about the research. So because I find that it's like too weak, and it doesn't right. even like I I never really entertained the idea that a white glaze would be a, a, an interesting thing to do. Like I have other ways to do you know a kind of a misty, cloud like thing. You can do that without zinc. It's not necessary. Hey, cool brush. What what is this? Show that. This is the uh, this is the Texan tickler. Uh, sorry, oh. I decided to call it that one. No, I'm kidding. This is the um, this is just a drafting brush that I stole from my dad's architectural drafting table when I was seventeen. And I never gave it back. So he would he used to sweep eraser dust off his architectural drawings uh, using that. Dad um, is an artist, and he was he, but he trained as, as an architect back in the day. And uh, he even did a bit of art architecture work, uh, kind of when I was going through high school. So um, yeah, there you go. So uh, yeah, just plenty. I, you can see I'm just kind of laying in some tones, having a good time. It's so cool hanging out and doing this, man. This is a good idea. Okay, so I don't know. Do, should we go into all the technical? Because we have questions. What about varnish? What about poppy oil? Uh, should we go for fun questions or just nerd out? 
Well, well, if, if people want to um, want to nerd out with us a little bit, I'm happy to do a bit of both. I'm happy to do some fun questions too. Uh, I need to get a, a different paper shield, so I'm just going to run and get a paper okay. shield. No problem. So just to, for Alan, what about the varnish? Yeah, the varnish will yellow, definitely. That's a thing, because everything yellow, so the varnish will protect the painting, first of all. It will block a lot of the UVs, and it will protect the original paint. So that's, you should varnish. And it will, it's removable, so yeah, it will yellow and you remove it you replace it that's how it's supposed to work and restoration like minimal restoration is just they just remove the old yellow varnish put a new one and that's it so really you want to make sure that your varnish is is um reversible i, I didn't catch the first part of that but I, yeah I, that's what i said as well I, yeah i said perfect, varnish perfect. is removable um, in all cases like yeah. there are some perfect, like you perfect. know traditional old varnish recipes don't get that get a modern varnish it's going to be much safer it's going to be yeah uh, much more transparent easier to remove and make sure that you keep track of what varnish has been used just in case like on your paperwork just write down for your clients what varnish was used this way i don't know they have a trace and whoever is going to find out like they still do their test samples and all but you know I think uh, it's still yep. valuable information. Okay, what about Absolutely. poppy oil? I heard it's good for not yellowing. Yep, it is. It's good for not yellowing and it dries very slowly, but it's kind of weak. It's, it's like the more, the stronger the oil, the more it yellows and the weaker, the less. But it's a matter of choice. Oh, poppy oil is very good for Ala Prima. Gives you a lot of open time. Okay. Fantastic. Andrew, do you ever use tools to blend while sketching or just keep going in layers? <laughs> no way. The timing of that question is... No, we have to I'm We have going... to skip. We have to skip through. You, you're not used to live streaming or you take way too many... Uh, you're used to the 24 hour... Uh, it's right but... here. I'm getting it. No, no, that's it. I'm getting it. Hang on. All right. Uh, so we can do yeah, that. Ah, blending tools. Blending tools. I can play with blending tools on this one. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I had to step away for a second. So that question could not have been better timed. Um, Perfect. So I'm going to play See? with some blending, blending on this uh, uh, with this, and try and smush around some of this uh, graphite on the karst. I, I, I love it. Oh, dude, I love it. That's that was that's nice the way that's working. So it blends very well. This paper. Yeah. I it recommend. looks. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of pixely. Here and there, I know. But... Again, next live stream, I'm gonna have my USB hub sorted oh, out, and cool. um, you can see my, my little bit of purple right there. Look at that, and that, this is the best bit of the drawing right now. Wow, so artistic! Um, such a bold choice, such a wild statement on you know well, bro, pollution, so and I it's like uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't live by those rules others choose to follow. You know, I'm a maverick. What can I say? Yeah. Do you even tish? Come on. <laughs> okay okay people say let's nerd out okay 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 let's do it. okay okay i'm on i'm down um let's do it so what are we nerding out about okay the titanium of my favorite brand brand the yellowed like crazy the titanium zinc seems perfect uh, so there was this huge, big video of a guy who made a whole series of tests. He had so many whites. Uh, I need to find it again, but I, I mean, it's far. I, in my memory, it's pretty far. But like, there was this guy who tried a lot of oil painting whites, and yeah, they all yellow, especially because he apparently what he did is he deprived the paint from all sunlight, so no light at all. Like complete darkness and apparently wow. the white yellows if it's in full darkness so make sure that you're not in direct sunlight but like there is some light in the room because apparently complete darkness while the white is drying is not good i don't know wow. never but this guy had like test samples and yeah it, it does actually yellow a lot and the michael harding is the white the the white that yellows the less which is the one i have 
Michael Hardy. Brilliant, man. Brilliant. Uh, okay. Too bad lead white is bad for us. Well, if you don't well, ingest don't, don't it, it yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if you don't have kids uh, around, I mean, say, here it's just a nightmare to get here in, in the EU, but other than that, yeah, if I could get my hands well, on some, I would do it. It's just like they just made it um they just made it illegal here in new zealand um so they're stopped all imports and sales of lead white it's now banned in my country but i don't know if you're importing it for private use is that still going to be an issue so i need to investigate that one if i'm not able to get it at all i have no idea what i'm going to do because i love lead white but um apparently there are some alternatives with nickel that I've yet to explore. So have you used nickel white before? I'm curious to know if you've experimented with that. Never, no. Never. So it might, might but make an interesting if, video. But if uh, you guys worry about titanium white, you should know that you have probably eaten a lot of it because it's actually a, a food coloring agent. So you have titanium white in chewing gums and stuff like that. Like everything that looks me, super bro. white. <laughs> I'm I'm living clean over here, man. <laughs> Chewing gum has titanium white. Are you serious? Yeah. Well, it's recently been like they've recently thought about. Okay, maybe we shouldn't put that in food, but it's actually food. It's used for making yeah. food look white. If you think about it, not a lot of uh, elements give white, and like you have zinc, lead, and titanium, so they don't have the choice. If the food has to look pure white. This is mm. the only one available. Or zinc, right, zinc, yeah, zinc. I, I think is not good. So yeah, that's what they use. Yeah, they feed us a lot of crap. Yeah. Take it easy on the Mentos. It's <laughs> the only thing I can think of that would be like pure white. But, um, uh, someone responds to Anna Petty uh, because she has, she's asking what sketchbook is this? We already... So either rewind or somebody in chat respond. Okay. Uh, varnish brings out the dark values to... Uh, why was Monet against varnishing? I don't know. I never heard about that. I, nev I never heard that. That's, that's really interesting. Um, if you know, hit us up. Uh, maybe I need to do a bit more uh, reading into that one. Maybe because he didn't want glare, uh, because of all like the texture. He had like almost pure impasto, and with varnish, he would have had like tons of like light peaks here and there. Oh, dude, that would have been a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Good thinking, man. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Uh, Ellie suggests, Andrew, you could use a little white gel or opaque gouache to cover that purple smudge. So she's really annoyed with that. You're really I'm ruining, so Andrew, you're ruining this stream. It was going great until you had to put this purple smudge on your uh, sketchbook. Really? I'm so sorry. What, will they please forgive me? Oh my me? god. Like, look but at how far work. my painting has gone. Like, I had painted Two feathers. You painted two feathers, man. Yeah, two that's, feathers. Well, I mean, I'm so productive today. I'm so so proud of just, myself. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm thinking what I could do is actually just crop the drawing, and uh, that'll be alright. But now the composition's ruined. Can't crop it there either. Trust me, I'm annoyed too, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ticked off, man. But I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna play now at this point. So I use this as an opportunity to uh, to uh, just. Well, this is me going bananas. Not very bananas, is it? I'm not getting too wild here. Scrooler says, I'll ship you some, Florin. Hit me up. What else do you ship? Because uh, do you have connections? Like real connections? <laughs> yeah, man. Okay. Okay. I, we need some lead white and a taxidermy bear up in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Queenix apparently bought flake white in the EU. Cool. I'll, I'll look up for it. I think awesome. you can get it, like if, but you have to testify that you're a professional. It's just not widely available. But like, if you do restoration, and I think as a professional artist, you might be able to say, "Hey, I'm a professional artist. I need it." I don't know. But because for restoration, you can get it, and it's not 
It's not completely illegal, it's just restricted. Right. Okay, Maybe Titanium I White apparently is also in well. toothpaste. So, okay, good. Good to know. You can paint with toothpaste. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, wow. Good enough for food, good enough for a canvas, lol. Well, pretty much. It does give you a moment of pause though, thinking about what on earth are they putting in your food? Like it really does. I think I just found out um, in recent years that, that uh, Pop-Tarts are one of the most toxic things you can eat. I, I grew up on Pop-Tarts, so I'm, I'm wondering what it did to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I never had this stuff. It's it really feels like the most American thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. <sighs> okay. I uh, love the details on the mountain, says Balsam. Balsam is just so nice. I know. I, I get some very nice uh, messages from her on Instagram. I appreciate you. Um, I know she's been following for a little while. It's cool. Like the, the art community online now, it's, it's, it's getting cool, right? It's, I, I just, I, I'm a little bit, um, well, I know maybe we're the same vintage. I think we worked out that you're, you're only three years younger than me, but I, you'll, you'll remember a time. And I'm sure many people here in the live chat will remember a time where we didn't have the internet or an opportunity to connect like this. Oh yeah. I think it's so, yeah. so awesome. You know, I, I've made a lot of friends around the world, even just from doing the podcast and, and just interviewing people. Um, that you know I, I wouldn't have met otherwise it's just um it gives us such a great opportunity as much as i hate the internet and things about it it gives us a real great opportunity to um to connect and grow as artists and and actually form a community i love that uh, let's start singing okay on in a minute uh, all right so I think I should get my Discord questions because I I have a Discord and they have priority. Sorry. If you want to have your question being priority, having priority, just go through the Discord. What is your thoughts on impressionists and post-impressionists? Um, hmm. You want to go first? No, go ahead. I think it was for you. Because I, okay. I think I, I talked about that before. Um, impressionism was really interesting. It's an interesting um, period in painting. But I, I think, you know, when you start looking into it, you know, French Impressionist, it was definitely a phenomenon, a movement that was happening in that area at that time. But you go around the world and you start to notice that there are actually schools that are popping up, you know, almost simultaneously. So in Australia, you had a group of Australian Impressionists called the Heidelberg School. The Russians had a particular thing going on. I mean, good night. Some of those Russians could paint. Like Levitan uh, was just a, a dynamite painter. Repin, I think, might have been earlier. I don't know. I'm not sure the mm -hmm. date on him. But um, then you also have Victorians. Um, and so there was all this really cool art happening around the same period of time. And so for me, like when I think of Impressionism, I'm not just thinking French Impressionism. I'm thinking about uh, 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 artists that captured the immediacy of the scene and just were laying down color in an interesting way, but were relatively loose. You know, but I, I think French Impressionists were really interesting from a point of view, and in particular artists like Monet, uh, Seurat took this to a, a, a whole nother level, but this optical color mixing, this phenomenon that you get where you're laying down really intense high chroma colors adjacent to one another, and the colors actually being mixed in your eye rather than on the palette or, or on the canvas necessarily. So if you look up close to one of Monet's haystacks, um, you'll you'll see uh, that an example of that. So I, I thought that that was really interesting, and they got some interesting things to offer painters working today. Um, some really great stuff that works there. Um, another artist that I really enjoy um, who did a bunch of that optical color mixing is Edgar Payne. And so I have a book of his. I, I, I don't recall ever seeing an original Edgar Payne. Maybe I might have seen one in the U.S. at some point, but nothing comes to mind. But I, I fortunately, in this one book, uh, A Scenic Journey, uh, which is all about Edgar Payne, um, 
there's some phenomenal plates in there where you can really see how he used optical color mixing and he would separate out colors and and you would see like he'd be laying down blues in a sky and then you'd put a pop of orange and a pop of red and then magenta in amongst a sky and it causes the blue to resonate all the more i thought that was really interesting post-impressionist hmm hmm I, I, I don't know. I, I, there's a certain point, there's a certain blind spot for me when it comes to art, art history. And it's pretty much everything that happened from about 1910, 1920 onwards. I, I don't really get into post-impressionism or, and it's not to say that all the painters were bad, but it starts giving way to modern art. And I, I'm not a fan. Dude, I'm not vibing with modern art at all. It makes me want to throw up my toenails, so. We can get into that if you want, but you probably I'll, I'll spare you. <laughs> How about you, Florent? I like Impressionist because it's when Cutter stopped being boring and really awesome. became, you know, like, but Cutter, like, really hue and chroma because, um, like, value was a very well established dimension of the Cutter. But, like, the rest, it, and it's mostly because of the just the chemistry wasn't there, it's just. Uh, they didn't have much in terms of uh, very strong cutters or it was super expensive. So uh, in the Impressionist era is just a moment in time when oh, photography was invented. So they were like, okay, what, what should we do? But photography was black and white. So they figured, hey, we still have something against it, right? It's like right now painters trying to figure out what should we do against AI? It's like they did the same with photography like in the 19th century. They came up with Impressionism. And post-Impressionism is, is just taking the same stuff and just making even more crazy cutters out of your imagination, being even more ex expressionist, trying to get more on the expressive side of art and more not impressions, but more expression. So like it's a, a, a moment in time, like one of the foundational moment that propelled like artists towards uh, the new era of uh, what came afterwards but like afterwards kind of a, a mess like we also had the question about what do you think about modern art and like all this stuff but like i don't know if you have time yeah. for that you can launch me on modern art forever and usually this is yeah. how my stream goes like i i talk <laughs> and i can go on for hours but like we have tons right. of questions, so it, like people really want to uh, ask you lots of stuff. Oh, can uh, I get controversial? Sure, go ahead. I think modern art was a massive conspiracy that was specifically designed to destabilize culture and remove us from traditional value. Okay, I'm gonna get counter go. controversial, <laughs> but I think modern art was a honest attempt to be kind of revolutionary and come up with something original and unique because the zeitgeist was different. I think contemporary art is that. Right. So, well, I, I, like, so uh, yeah, it's important to define terms. Okay, perhaps. So yeah. modern art is like, let's say after Impressionism and post-Impressionism, you have like... Uh, all the isms, the avant-garde, and the center of modern art is Paris. Like Picasso, think futurism in Italy, think surrealism. This is modern art. Everything that ends in ism, because the artists at the time, they were trying to redefine and set new rules for the art of the future. They had like this idea of, uh, you know, let's make something different and unique. Because like the modern man needs to do, or woman, needs to do something uh, something different. Let's make something original that's never been seen before. And this spirit, I think it's like, this is still art. Like this is something that artists can be doing like genuinely with like, with honesty. Like you want to do something very unique. You want to innovate as an artist. So I think modern art was, but like these, if you think about it, these isms, they only lasted like a couple years max and that's it like most of them they didn't last long and after that after the second world war actually there was a cultural shift like because paris was not like europe was not the center of the world anymore it switched to the us and this this is when the united states thought 
hey, can we become the center of the cultural world? Like they already had Hollywood. So that's good, but we need to have like visual arts as well. But we don't want to take modern arts again and do the same thing because that's already old. And it's already like the, the old world is doing modern art. We are doing more than that. We are doing contemporary. So they invented and they actually promoted and pushed like even like like it's not conspiracy or anything. It's like through the CIA, they promoted contemporary art to just transpose the center of oh. the art world, like oh. from the West, uh, from that. Europe to New York, basically, that's the big idea. Yeah. So they wanted something yeah. super innovative, even more innovative than modern art. But if you think about it, like modern art was already super crazy. Like you had guys like Duchamp and this guy oh, tried everything. He started. He, yeah. he was like, yeah. he did all the provocation in the wells. He did this. Like the monochromes, it was already done in Russia in, like, in 1917. So it was already done. So they had to do even like more stuff like with conceptual performance. And this is when art really got crazy. And this is when art really started to be about big money. Big, big, big money. Yeah. I, I so I, I'm I'm still I'm absolutely convinced that Pollock, uh, Warhol, and de Kooning were on the CIA payroll. I'm oh yeah, still convinced. Yeah, they, uh, they were promoted, yeah. but like, you know, like the Ministry of Culture in France, they are trying to promote artists from here. Like they're trying to uh, have like selected artists in their list of you know promotion list. They want to so they have yeah. um, th there's like. Uh, taxpayers' money that goes to founding founding artists because like that's what a government wants. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's not like it's not conspiracy. It's just like a country trying to push its art forward and make a like become the most important dog in the fight. Because so of I um yeah no I, I I hear you man I I think no no go go on go on no no I, you're making a good point there. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and then this is when this is when the the money laundering machine started, and this is when they realized, okay, we're not gonna wait for like six months for this guy to finish a complicated, intricate painting to sell it. Plus, since it has like kind of an objective value, people can see if we're trying to scam them. So what we're gonna do is going we are going to destroy all the values all the objective criteria through academia and through you know universities we are going to destroy everything that can help people objectively evaluate what a painting is worth this way we can put any price tag on any type of art even like a trash can we can call this art given the right circles if you're in the right circles you can put a 1 million dollar label on trash can and call this art and sell it so that's that's when it started because but they had to destroy yeah. all the values before because they had to destabilize people enough so that they don't know what to think anymore and this is why it's like it's visual arts is completely unpopular anymore because people feel that that they are treated as fools and they are in a way because the point was to destabilize the population enough so that they don't know how to judge anymore. And they don't know what's right and what's wrong. And people are yeah. super, super uh, reliant on the price of something to evaluate what it's worth in terms of like objectively. Like if I give you yeah. two bottles of wine, one is $1,000 and the other one is like, is it like just a buck. And I make you taste, and it's actually the same wine, the same wine. But I, I trick you, but I, I put a different price tag on both the bottles. You'll have more pleasure, more actual pleasure. Like the, the, your brain is going to be triggered more with the 1,000 bottle. Guarantee. It's oh, like... Yeah. Absolutely. No, so that, people that's, don't that's know how really to judge good. based on their, what they experience. They judge based on the entire context. So if you destroy the context that allows people to understand what's good and bad, well, you can sell anything. It's the magic. Oh, my God.
I don't think I, that was summed up so beautifully, man. I, I I could not have put that any better. That 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 was phenomenal. Absolutely, absolutely. And I want to respond to something that I just saw in the chat. Um, who was this? Uh, it, just kind of to what you're saying. Um, art is so subjective and personal for everyone. So I, I don't know, I don't know about that. So I think what you're talking about there is this: what we used to have pre modern contemporary movements what we used to have was an exploration of traditional value and objective truth and so when it comes to like expression i, I no longer think about expressing myself i just think about what's the truth uh, wh what is the truth for me and let me respond to something that i genuinely find beautiful and so i think i think when we're just being honest um we start getting in this territory where we start resonating with more people that are switched onto that. I, I think there is, rather than it being so subjective, I think when we really start to get into the traditional nitty gritty, it starts becoming more objective. Oh yeah. I don't know. People know yeah. what, what is good. They still know. They still flock yeah. in droves in like traditional museums and they like it. Yeah, man. But like this weird contemporary performance where the guy is shitting on some canvas and then just <laughs> spreading it. Like people know that oh. it's bullshit. They just are it afraid there, of folks. they're just afraid of calling it out for what it is. Because they are looked um like with um I don't know how you call this, disdain or is, is this no. a word? Like you they're... call it what you want, man. I call that crap art. You know. What I'm yeah, that's crap art. But like, you get ridiculed by you know an elite for saying that you don't understand. Well, you just don't get it. Oh, stuff them. You are not educated enough to understand the true meaning of uh, what it means to shit on a canvas and spread it with your feet. Oh no. Um, because you know it's it's a statement about how you know. People in Myanmar are oppressed and blah, 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 you know, all this bullshit. Yeah, yeah, I I, no, I, I hear you 100%, 100%. Can I be really uh, unprofessional at this point? I'm not uh, I'm not a veteran live streamer uh, like you. I, I, need, I need to use the restroom real quick. I'll oh, right yeah, sure. Back. Is that okay? I'll go ahead and yeah, read okay. chat. No problem. Cool, cool. Okay, you're left with me. So you can talk trash about Andrew. No problem. He's not there. Oh, finally. I, I thought we would never get rid of this guy. Ah, really? He's... <laughs> okay. Coming from a Frenchman. What? 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 All right. Uh, you're so right for... Yeah, no, the thing is, uh, for this comment, I'm not going to read it out loud, you can read it, but the thing is, not anybody could do it, you have to be in the right circle, you, so you have to be part of a very, very little club, like an elite, so, yeah, we can't do it, well, we can do it, we still have to do that, and try our best, and they call it crap, based on their criteria, because we're not part of the same club. It's really a very restricted, like the more you restrict, let's keep in mind that something super important is the difference between visual arts and music is with music, if you want success, you want a very wide audience and high, you want to be high in popularity for Visual arts, as they work today, like the kind of scam, tax evasion scheme that they're working on at the moment, you want something hyper elitist and hyper, if you can be unpopular, it's even better. So they have to make sure that it's very, it's limited to a very, very, very small club because you can't mass produce and broadcast art visual art as you do music you can't lie with music if it's if it's not popular music you can't sell it if it's unpopular art it's actually an advantage because you can say yeah nobody gets it but 
you because you're the elite. So now just get your checkbook and just sign it because this is worth uh, this is worth uh, getting it. They can sell this kind of stuff with this strategy. It's it's yeah that's that's how they work. That's how it operates. Exactly the emperor's new clothes. Exactly this. If you don't know this fable or this story, I mean it's still as true as anything. It describes the world of art better than anything I can say. Check out the emperor's new clothes by um, Anderson. Yeah, the emperors with the right spelling. Sorry. I'm having a little bit of camera trouble here. Sorry, folks. Let me just plug this back in again. Yeah, people in chat were actually um, saying how good the stream is when you were gone. They were really mean, but I corrected them. I'm sorry. Like they're... Well, thank you. I'm, I'm <laughs> so glad you had my back, bro. Thank they said, wow, much. the quality of the stream suddenly jumped so high. <laughs> <laughs> That's so mean, dude. No, Careful, I'm feelings. kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> they were actually booing me. Boo, bring it. Bring Andrew back. <laughs> Um, there was a, there was a question here. I'm not sure if uh, if you address this, but um, interesting. Uh, what do you guys think about selling prints instead of original art, uh, original work? Yeah. Does it diminish the value of an artist? Did you address that one? No, but we can. Okay, and that's from my yeah. mighty v or mighty VP. Sorry if I'm yeah. pronouncing your name. Try to apologies. But, uh, it like yeah, flush. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got, a, got a little bit of rosy cheeks up in here because it's. Uh, <laughs> says k rocker 81 great name uh yeah yeah it's 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 the glare it's a natural glow i i pinch i don't use rouge i pinch no it's getting swelteringly hot up here in the studio it's, yeah, summer it's, here in it's the summer yeah yeah and so I, I i go red we're gonna deal with it right cool excellent um, but Prince, uh, Prince is an interesting one because I, I think Prince is a really great strategy to supplement your income as an artist. Oh, yeah, definitely. I actually think it can, if you do it right, it can do the opposite rather than diminish the value of your work. It can actually increase the value of your work. It can actually spread your market out there to more people. Again, mm -hmm. if you do it right, but you have to make some sort of distinction between the print and the original. Cause sometimes what people can get in the trap of doing is making a print to mimic the original. And that's where I think you're getting into, not to suggest anybody is doing this, but that you can get into a territory where you're kind of a, a bit deceptive by doing that. So it's a poster. It, really clear that, it depends. Do you want yeah. to sell a print, a high quality print or a poster? Yeah. Because if yeah, it's exactly. a poster, so, like you diminish by doing posters, like cheap, yeah, cheap reproductions, for sure. you diminish for the value sure. of your art. But it doesn't have to be like so, that. Personally, I, I, I like um, I, I use a Giclée process. I like doing that on like on a high quality paper. I use Hanamula uh, paper, which is a cotton rag, acid free paper. It's a, and so and they're limited edition as well. But when you're printing your work, I, I tend to stick to 60 to 75 percent the size of the original so that the original is big and it's impressive. And then the print is just a little limited edition at, at a smaller scale. And you're not getting into this territory where you're, um, you know, you know, getting where you're trying to sell replicas or, or knockoffs. That said, look, I, I'm not a fan of his work, so don't go hating on me. But I, a fascinating book um, or audio book that you need to listen to while you're working on your art in the studio is The Billion Dollar Painter by Eric Kusky. It's the story of Thomas Kincaid. It is it is fascinating. Trust me on that. It is a fascinating book. It goes into his life. Can you type it in chat? Yeah. Maybe so, so just do your best. This book, this book is. Um, I'll I'll type it in here. Yeah. This book here, Alan Voss. Don't put a sad face on. It's all right. I'm I'm gonna explain. I'm gonna explain here. See, Alan's already hating. Uh, let's let's go. Uh, the billion dollar. Yeah, painter. I know about this story. I, this I, this I, guy, I, I Kincaid. Don't, I don't recommend. I don't recommend doing what he did either. Okay. Um, but it, it's just it's just interesting. Um. It's just interesting this it, Thomas Kincaid's life story mm -hmm. and how yeah. he ended up doing what he did. What do you, you, you know? He's like so or not? he is so hated by the art elite. Oh, so dude, hated! Oh, no, no, yeah, of they course. they but, are just it, disgusted by the existence of this guy yeah. and his yeah. popularity. His yeah. like the fact that he's widely popular. 
it makes them mad. Like the, the super Absolutely. high end art the, elite. The two things that are that are really interesting here now, from an art business point of view, and, and we don't need to get too business minded about it. We're still artists. We want to produce art from the heart, you know, and not get too commercial. I get that. But there are two things that he did that I thought were fascinating. One, he's I think he I believe he's the first artist ever while he was alive to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and they surpassed four billion dollars in sales. That's one. And when you see what he did, if you're not familiar with Thomas Kincaid's work, it'll shock you when you see what he actually did. And two, more homes across the world. Uh, he he is collected by more people than any other artist ever. For a guy that was rejected, that was rejected yeah, by the rejected entire by art world. Yeah. So yeah, and he died with he died with tens of millions of dollars in the bank. Again, not that it's all about money. Okay, don't get it twisted. Mm -hmm. I just think that it, it's it's interesting from a from a business standpoint. Yeah, I mean, come on, this art is not my thing. All right? Yeah, I'm not into it. Not my thing but, as well. But I, I just I think it's fascinating. I think it's absolutely fascinating. I made a video years ago where I put him up there as like kind of. A, a role model of sorts and dude i got some hate i'm like hang on a second just listen but after i read the book i had a bit more context i would not do a lot of the things that this uh, he is a company and a lot of this probably wasn't his doing he was probably pressured into this because he started off painting this stuff he was discovered by a bunch of vacuum cleaner salesmen that worked for kirby and then they pushed his work and he went stratospheric they, they realized they had something lightning in a bottle and they went for it but you look at this stuff, man. I mean, I, I, I am putting this on my wall, but people do. People do. Go figure. But back to the prince thing. The prince of this is what made him famous. So the value of the print was put out there. And then what ended up happening, it, it's through mass production of the prints. So he would have a print run of 500,000 or whatever it would end up being for, for this number of prints. Read the book. It's fascinating. That would make the original painting so coveted that it started to jack up the price of an original. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I couldn't even tell you what an it's original the, Thomas Kincaid would be. I, I was that. talking about the difference between music when where you're trying to reach high popularity and visual arts where you can't because you have so little works to sell that you, you don't need popularity. It's actually the equivalent of what music would be in the form of paintings. Like widely popular, not good, like like just like pop music, it's not not good, but like a lot of people listen to that. Yeah. And big yeah. numbers. That's it. Yeah. Absolutely, man. So yeah. So Absolutely. right now people are not seeing what you're uh, doing. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll change the camera. I thought you were I'm saying I'm saying that I'm because sorry. uh I'm not doing anything. <laughs> man, I've painted like how many yeah, not even three phases. We're, we're talking. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to uh, be be terrible and, and go here in, in about uh, let's say about twenty minutes time. Um, Absolutely no. You already lasted two hours and like you can go when, whenever you want. Like really, man, it's already such a pleasure. Cool. To See ya. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm really liking Gay Rocker 81's comments, by the way. I'm enjoying his oh, uh, yeah. contribution to the chat. So always. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> oh, this, this descended quickly. But, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting when you, when you start getting into that, you do start to ruffle feathers when you start talking about the art business. But this is a, one of the things that I, we talk about a bunch on my podcast. Flora, I, I'm, I'm going to say right now, I'm gonna. I'm officially inviting you right now on the live stream to join me for a podcast someday soon. Can we Perfect. do that. Oh yeah, sure. awesome man, awesome. Cool. I'd love to interview you and hear your story and, and we get that recorded. Um, it's not live, but you know, it's good fun. But the um, our, uh, yeah, the great question about the prints. I I would do it, but again, just um, make sure you're not. Uh, you know, reduce the size of the actual print, print on quality paper and keep it limited edition. It can be a great way to supplement your income. And it's tough out there, man. Like trying to make it just selling originals. You can do it. I did it for, for well over 10, 15 years, but you know, it, it does help having some, some other avenues of, of income coming in. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's just a matter of like, what strategy do you want? Like, I know that I personally don't want to get into printmaking too much because I know that it's going to take me way too much time for what I really want to do. So I just 
because I get enough from all the YouTube, the courses that I do on the side, I don't need to make prints. Like, I know that it's an option that I'm, I might do at some point, but it's just, uh, yeah. at the moment, I just want to, like, you, like, it would take too much for me to learn right now, like, in terms of checking the quality of the reproductions, checking, getting the right paper, finding the right, yeah, you know, finding the right guys. I know it's possible, it's just, like, I don't want to spend the time at the moment. It's not part of my strategy, yeah. but it's definitely yeah, a, a, a very good one. So it's so not. What would you say? Can can I ask you a direct business question? Uh, you don't don't have to answer this. Maybe it's a little bit rude. I beg your pardon. But uh, what would you say as an artist working today? Is your main source of income? Is it your original painting, or is it oh, the no. online teaching? No, it's obviously like the YouTube stuff, the courses, stuff like that. Patreon. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting the shift for me. It used to be one hundred percent originals, but then when I when I went online and discovered YouTube, and I was already a teacher. I loved to teach, but it was always live workshops on a weekend at an art society in, in in Perth in Western Australia when I was living over there. But when I when I went online, man, good night. That uh, that was a game changer for me. Um, and I, I I live for that stuff now, man. Like I, I love interacting and interfacing with people all over the world. You know, students or fellow artists. I, I just this is my jam. And so the, the original sales, I'll sell originals. I'll do commissions, and uh, and I'm bringing prints back. But the the online teaching for me is where it's at. I, I'm super passionate about this. Yeah, um, what I like I, about I, the online, like the online teaching, but like I'm I'm. I think I'm very lucky that I picked up YouTube when it wasn't too crowded and all. So I'm I'm grateful that I had this idea when I first started that I didn't wait to become good to start and I I just jumped right in. Like yeah. right now it's maybe I don't know some some people just come like just uh, arrive kind of late and they still can just uh, skyrocket to success but it's, I think a lot of channels struggles right now like it's very crowded yeah. but it's like been, the good um, thing about this strategy oh, is like it allowed me to make my paintings and i'm doing kind of the youtube stuff on the side and using the content that i produce as sort of teaching material and i but i mostly work on my art and that's what i like i don't have to do live lessons i don't have to get a get a special studio to have students so like that's cool to be online you get your own hours mm -hmm. it's great yeah yeah absolutely man absolutely Th there was a really interesting question i i just um there's just always interesting questions <laughs> uh I, I just saw it come up as uh, do you think you can uh, this is from quinix uh do you yep. think you can become a great artist while working full time in addition to practice for like 10 hours every week what do you think about that florent Absolutely, yeah. I used to work full time, then I worked half time, and so I sort of um, made it. I didn't jump straight it into becoming an artist full time. I just made it progressively. So just, uh, however, like become how is it about like do you get enough training time? Just I don't know. It really depends on how confident you are in your skills and how you. How you how you practice how much actual yeah. time you have to practice it's also that sometimes yeah. optimizing your time can be worth really like worth your time i don't know how it, I, if it makes sense just having oh, all yeah. your setup in place so that you don't have to like spend hours cleaning every time re-preparing every time and pick up like after you're done with your day job you can just come and just finish your painting and this, if you can optimize, yeah, definitely, you can you can work on the side. Yeah, I I, I agree with that 100%. And, and I'm a big fan of having your space optimized and ready to go. So let's say you only did have like that 10 hours a week to work, then you want to make sure you've got your setup. So as soon as you're ready, let's say you get two hours a day, five days a week, you're ready to just boom jump into it and this is kind of why i started the sketch endeavor series over on uh, on my youtube channel is to get that daily drawing time in um have i done it no because life happens and i had a kid and it's um oh wow dude you're getting super chats that's fantastic look at that 
Amazing. I needed to start doing so I've never done a super chat in my life. I wouldn't even know how to. That's uh I, I need to start doing that. That's cool. Yeah. Um but I will say on behalf of this live stream and and and, and Florent uh, that uh thank you for that. I, I'll uh do I do I get some of that? <laughs> don't get it. Don't get it. It's fine. But having your space ready to go, man, is is absolutely uh essential. But I I I'm a big fan of um, Tony Robbins. I'm not sure if uh, uh, the people here follow him. I mean, he's very, very popular, very well known. But one thing he talks about for skill acquisition is immersion. The more time, obviously, you can dedicate mm -hmm. to a pursuit, the yeah. better. Uh, so one thing I'd really do is aggressively go after those things that you spend your time on. Take a week, have a time journal. And just write down or, or an app you could do this on an app sometimes that might be, even be easier for us today mm -hmm. but start working out where are you spending your time and see if you can start to eke out even more time over the week for your yeah hours. journaling so is definitely quickly thing. become 20 to 30 hours just by saying well maybe i don't need to watch law and order maybe i don't need to go and do that thing maybe i could actually get somebody else to run that errand for me mm -hmm. oh more time for art more time for art more time for art so have a look at that when i started writing down what i was doing with my time dude it was <laughs> scary it was scary and i realized i was losing a lot of time in transitions between tasks. yeah so yeah so much from one thing to the next and because it's so boring you just yeah. you want to do something else and you procrastinate so yeah yeah what's boring sorry what what's so boring like, you know, all the, like, look, the studio chores. Oh, yeah, 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 fair enough, fair enough. Like, like kind of cleaning up kind of thing? Yeah. Or getting ready, getting set up? Yeah, getting ready. Yeah. Just, yeah, I, like, it takes me, like, one hour minimum to get ready, and I have a very optimized setup. But, like, just Dude. preparing the, the paint tubes, like, preparing the... No, I can jump if I, if I want to go re really fast, I can do it in like 30 minutes, but like usually like just, uh, yeah, taking out everything, making like I'm, I'm a slow person in the morning, so uh, I can work very late at, li at night, but when I arrive in my studio in the morning, I'm very slow to, to start. So I'm like a diesel yeah, engine. I, I, I... I got to pay this guy again some more credit here. Gay Rocker 81, money for nothing and your tips for free at Dire Straits. Dude, that ain't working. <laughs> that's the way you do it. That guy, that guy's, that guy's my, that, that's my jam right there, brother. That's awesome. But, um, yeah, I, I think, I, I think I've got it down to maybe 10 minutes at the outside to get ready, dude. Like, I, I it's, it's got to be on hand. Boom. Maybe, maybe you should start using liquid. Maybe that's the thing. Mm -hmm. or maybe you got to use liquid. Yeah. Get that back again. It might speed you up. <laughs> Actually, what speeds me up is when I prepare before, like the stuff is ready overnight. And when I come back in the morning, it's ready to start. Yeah. This is what saves yeah. me the most time. But that's, that's just my way of, you know, starting slowly. But I, I finish very late. So I kind of compensate. Oh my god, we haven't done e any of, like, you're you're going to be gone soon and we haven't done any of the questions. Oh my god, they're going to oh, hate goodness. me. Well, before I, uh, well, we can get into some questions. I'll answer a few questions before I go. But let me, um, let me just say, if, if anybody is interested in following me, if you want to just check out, uh, the best place to find me is on my website, andrewtischler.com. But also, uh, if you want to take your skills further, and again, I, I hope you don't mind this plug for it. But oh, no, I, absolutely. Uh, I, I do have a, an online academy called Tish Academy, of course. Of course, it's called Tish Of course, Tish I'm going to try to awesome. show it. It's there's um sure. there's two different tiers uh, a studio tier at five bucks a month an academy tier at eighteen dollars a month and it's Black why, Friday why, why, boom oh no so that's my website so that's uh, that's just on my uh, uh, for tutorials so if you click tutorials in the top left uh, or shop in the top left if the button's changed I think it might be shop now uh, then you'll be able to there you go and you'll see all my my courses but if you click on academy. Florent, if you go, if you go up there and click on the academy, this will take you to my my academy page, mm -hmm. and this is where you can sign up and follow me. It's kind of like Patreon, but so much better. So we've got a course library on here that is well over a hundred hours of content 
on material to do with portraits, landscapes, still life. And there's we've just finished our fundamentals course. So if you're new to oil painting, this would be the place where you'd want to kind of start out. And, and also there's a community. There's an exclusive community of hundreds of members now. We've got actually we're just over a thousand members now from all over the world that's where you cool, can interact man. with people. In so that's where you live stream. Is that it? When and you that, do and, your live streams? This is where I live stream. Oh, exactly. And every week I'm going live with my academy students where I'm painting. Uh, I occasionally draw, but I'm mainly painting live with my, with my students. And uh, there's challenges. There's all kinds of really cool stuff. Critique videos, professional development videos. And you can reach me directly anytime through the academy. So uh, check Tish it out. Academy. Um, Perfect. So it, the URL is tish.academy. Now, you know, it's going to make it super risk-free and painless for you. There's a seven-day free trial as soon as you sign up. So if you decide after a few days you don't love it, then, you know, no hard feelings. Uh, you won't be charged anything. But it also comes with 30-day money-back guarantee. I'm normally pretty easygoing. So if you're like, hey, this sucks, uh, I'll give your money back. That hasn't happened, though. So uh, I'm, I'm very blessed that that hasn't happened yet. But maybe somebody will. <laughs> so... But it, it's good. This So this is where I do most of my teaching now. And this is where I'm interacting the most with, with folks. Um, and I absolutely cool, man. I'm super passionate about it. Yeah. It's like the so, equivalent of Thanks having, everyone. like, you know, your, your live sessions in person, but like it's online. It's like a studio space where you teach. People get there, exactly. hang out. It's cool. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's it, it's been such a blessing having that. I mean, it's, it's so it was. We, I originally started on Patreon, and then I was like, no, you know what? I got to get on my own site because we needed a place to be able to to have everybody interact with each other, upload their own artwork, comment on each other's paintings, all enter that chat, start commenting and critiquing people's paintings. It's a, just a great community, and it's a great place to learn and grow. Um, and there, there have even been, you know, lifelong friends that have been made. I, I've been doing it now for about three years, but there's people there that have, that have met from, they're like, oh, you're in Montana. I'm in Montana too. Let's hang out and go painting. And, and now they're buddies, you know, it, this is happening all the time. It's, it's, it's just, yeah, it's been a fantastic networking. Felicia, place. Felicia White says bottom left on the collage. That's mine from, uh. Like one of the, the paintings uh, that you showed on your website. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The girl picked us. Fantastic. From Andrews, yeah, apparently, from the Facebook. <laughs> yeah, Pickles Pico de Gallo. Um, yeah, some people are, are talking about the pickles. Just to give context to the pickles, I did a demonstration called Chili Pickle, which is a still life painting. Um, I won't leave the stream and go get it, but a still life painting where we were taking random objects and talking about things in terms of line and shape, tone, color, and edge, giving way to form, depth, light, and material. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's it's helped kind of teach in a structured way and give people all of the information because it can be confusing, right? There, there's a lot of information to get through, so uh, that's kind of where I put all the best my best stuff. Anyway. Thanks for it, for, for allowing that plug. And, and thanks again for allowing me to. Well, that's cool. I think uh, if you think that you're good with your drawing, I think um, I can let you go, man. Like you've been working hard <laughs> two and a half hour, like two hour 40 almost. Yeah, I didn't I get know, much wow. into the uh, into the into the detail here, into the weeds. Yeah, the no worries. Here. Like I, this I'm is not so the place. Upset. This is not a place where we this. accomplish a lot of things. I, I think you can see that from how much it <laughs> has changed. <laughs> um, but oh, I, but so, I have to say, like, so, I, I, didn't, I didn't have time to do much, but I usually, I normally, if, you, if it's your first time watching me, I normally actually paint a little bit more than just this bit. It's just that there were so many comments, people were popping out from all over the place and Andrew was so entertaining. I had to watch. I'm mean, like you, I just want to watch. So sue me. No, don't sue me for that. That's that's ridiculous. But hey. <laughs> Hey man, All right, look, I'll go back to I'll go back to selfie view. But um, yeah, thank you for watching me scribble around on a, on a bit of paper, and it's it's but this has been super cool, man. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, like here we go. The interaction is cool, I and like back. the people are just so nice. So, all right. <laughs> awesome. Um, so um, yeah, look, thanks again. Um, really, really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, so what I'm going to do. 
is uh, separately, I'm gonna I'm gonna email you, Florent, and and I'm gonna send you an invite to the podcast. Let's do a podcast together. I think I think there's more material on that modern art rant. <laughs> that would be so much fun. But uh, oh, yeah. but also, I, I you can you can you can throw some shade at the Zorn palette and do all that good stuff. So, <laughs> no problem. Yeah, good good fun. But, all right. Um, no, thank you thank to you. everyone thank in chat much, as well. Adam. Thank you. You've been amazing. Sending Andrew Thanks, so everyone. much love. You've been there for the Tish. The Tish army has been there. <laughs> oh, respect, guys. Thanks so much. My Tish, my Tish all right. That's awesome. <laughs> all right. Stay with me, Andrew. Uh, uh, stay with me in Zoom, and I'll say goodbye to everybody in chat. Thank you for being here, and bye-bye. Uh, See you next time. God bless. <laughs>